My name is Mike. In this course, I'm going to teach you guys everything you need to know to get started writing PHP. A PHP is an awesome programming language, and it's actually a programming language that you can use on the web. So if you're looking to build an awesome, scalable, and easily maintainable website or web application, then PHP is an awesome language to do it with. PHP is great because it integrates super well with HTML. So you can actually write your PHP code right along with HTML and they'll work together perfectly. There are millions of websites and web applications that are currently online which use PHP and rely on PHP on the back end. And PHP is what we would call a server side language. So it's basically a language that's going to sit on the web server and it'll be able to interact with the client and do different things in order to make your website more powerful. In this course, we're going to cover the bare basics. So I'm just going to get you guys up and running with PHP. We'll talk about installing PHP, getting everything set up. Um, we'll look at creating your first PHP file and we'll talk about like how PHP can interact with HTML and then we're going to get a little bit more advanced. We'll talk about how we can use PHP to get input from a HTML form. We'll look at how PHP can be used in combination with HTML to make our websites more powerful. And then we're going to look at just some general programming concepts, things like uh, if statements and for loops and arrays and data structures. So we're going to get into not only how PHP can be used on the web, but also how PHP can be used just as a general programming language. Then finally, we're going to talk about object oriented programming. So we're going to look at how we can use PHP to create things like classes and objects. So if all that stuff sounds good, then this course has something for you. I'm really excited to be bringing you guys a PHP course. And hopefully by the end of this course, you have a better understanding of PHP and you can get started writing your very own web application. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how to install and set up PHP on Windows. So PHP is actually pretty easy to set up. We basically just have to download a few files and we're actually going to have to modify something um, in our Windows computer and then we should be able to have everything set up and ready to go. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that. And the first thing we want to do is just head over to our browser. We're going to go ahead and download something. And I'm actually over here on this website. It's called php.net. So it's a pretty simple web address. And over here, there's going to be an option for downloads. So we're going to go ahead and click downloads and you'll see over here, there's a bunch of different options. Uh, we want to click windows downloads because we're on windows. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And now over here, you'll see that there's a bunch of different options. Um, this is going to be the latest version of PHP that's going to be available. So in our case, it's 7.1. Um, and what I want to do is basically pick the version that's appropriate for my operating system. In my case, I have a 64 bit operating system and I'm going to choose this thread safe version. So if you have a 32 bit operating system, you can uh, pick this guy up here. In my case, I'm going to pick this one. And you'll see here there's an option for a zip file. So I'm just going to click on this and that's going to go ahead and download this zip file. And this zip file has all the files that we need to start using PHP. So when that is finished downloading, let's just hop over to our downloads folder and you'll see here we have this zip file. So what I want to do is I actually want to extract this. So I'm going to go ahead and extract all the files that are in here into a, another folder. So I'm just going to click extract all. And down here, I basically just want to type in the name of the folder where I want to store these. Um, in my case, and just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and just store these at the root directory of the C drive. And I'm going to store them inside of a folder called PHP. So I'm basically making this folder here PHP, and I'm going to go ahead and extract all of these files into that folder. So um, once we've typed that in, I'm just going to click extract. And this is going to go off and extract all those files into a new folder called PHP at the root directory of our C drive. Here's the thing. If you want to put them somewhere else, you can put them somewhere else. Um, but to fully follow along with what I'm doing, you can put them at the root directory of your C drive. All right. When that's finished extracting, you'll see that it opens up this PHP folder here. So here I am on the C drive. And over here we have our PHP folder and in here, there's just a bunch of files. So you really don't have to worry about any of these files. Um, obviously don't touch any of them or modify any of them, but as long as we have these here in this folder, then we're ready to go. So we have everything downloaded. Now we have to do one more thing, which is called configuring our windows path variable. Essentially what this means is we have to tell windows that PHP is inside of this folder. 
So eventually we're gonna want to run PHP and use it and use all of its functionality. And in order to do that, we have to tell Windows about it. So we basically just have to tell Windows where we put PHP. So down here, I'm gonna go in my search bar and I'm basically just gonna start typing in environment. So E-N-V-I-R-O-N. -N. And this option over here should pop up. It says edit the system environment variables. This is what we want. So we're gonna click on that. And this should open up a window where we can configure our path variable. So this window is gonna open up here. There should be an option down here that says environment variables. You wanna click that. And over here, there's going to be a couple different options. We wanna go over here to this where it says variable path. So wherever you see this path variable, I'm just gonna click edit. So we wanna edit this variable. And basically this is just a Windows system variable that kind of tells Windows where a bunch of executable files are. So what we wanna do is we wanna tell uh, Windows about PHP and we can do that by telling Windows where it is inside of this path variable. So I'm just gonna click new over here. And then down here in this little uh, typing box, we can just type in capital C colon backslash PHP. So I'm basically typing in the location of the folder where I extracted all those PHP files. So once we do that, we can just click OK and that's gonna go ahead and be added to the path variable. So I'm gonna click out of this, click OK, click OK over here. And now we want to make sure that that worked. So once again, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go down to the search bar and I'm just gonna type in CMD this time. And this option over here for command prompt should show up, so you wanna click that. And the command prompt is basically just a way that we can interact with the computer using text commands. So down here in the command prompt, the first thing I'm gonna do is just type in echo, percent sign, P-A-T-H in all capitals and then percent sign. And this is gonna go ahead and print out that path variable. So we wanna make sure that the entry PHP is in here. So we wanna make sure that that folder is showing up there. As long as it's showing up there, then uh, we, were, we successfully updated the path variable. Now the last thing that we wanna do is just uh, check to make sure PHP is working. So I'm just gonna type in PHP hyphen V and I'm gonna hit enter and we should get this version number popping up for PHP. So as long as you get a version number popping up here and you're not getting any errors, then you've officially installed PHP on your computer. And believe it or not, that's actually all we're gonna to need to get started writing PHP and building an awesome website. So um, stick around for the next tutorial and I'm gonna show you guys how to get started creating your first PHP file. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about choosing a text editor for PHP. So whenever we're writing our PHP programs, one of the most important parts of the whole process is gonna be the environment where we're writing our PHP code. And really with PHP, it's simple. Any text editor is gonna work. Any text editor where you can save a .php file is going to be able to support PHP. So you don't need some special configuration. You don't need some special text editor any old text editor will do. Now, if you already have experience working with something like HTML or CSS or JavaScript, then the text editor that you use for those programming languages can be used for PHP. So, so generally, you're going to be writing your PHP alongside something like CSS or HTML or JavaScript. So if you already have a text editor that you're comfortable with in those languages, then you can just use that same text editor. But if you're new to all this, or new to web development and stuff like that, then I'll kind of walk you guys through what your options are. I mean, really your options range from like the simplest of text editors to something that is like super specialized for PHP. Really all you need is like notepad or text edit, you know, the simplest text editor that comes with your operating system. But a lot of people will like to use more of like a specialized text editor, you know, something that is designed to support the PHP language, something that'll give you things like syntax highlighting and you know can maybe even like show you where the errors are in your code and really just with a simple google search you could find a bunch of different text editors that are designed and support php in this tutorial i'm going to be using a text editor called adam and this is a text editor that was created by github and it's just a text editor that i personally like to use um, and so i'm actually going to show you guys how you can download and install that but I also do just wanna say that just because I'm using this Atom text editor doesn't mean that you have to. Like I said, there's a lot of these different text editors out there and really, you know, the best text editor for you to use is gonna be the one that you're most comfortable with. So what I would do is just do a quick Google search, you know, look up in what text editors seem to work for people with PHP 
and you can kind of get an idea of what you can use. But like I said, any old text editor is gonna work. So um, well, I'm gonna go ahead and download the Atom text editor. So if you don't really care what you're gonna use, then you can just follow along with me and we'll be using the same text editor throughout the course. So I'm gonna come down here to my web browser and I'm gonna go ahead and just do a Google search for Atom text editor. And this should pop up here. It's this website, atom.io. So I'm just gonna click this. And depending on the operating system you're using, a option should come up here for downloading it. So if you're on Mac, this would say like download OS X. I'm on Windows, so I'm just gonna click this and it's gonna go ahead and give me this atomsetup.exe file. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that now that I downloaded it. And you can see over here, it's starting to install on my computer. So basically all you need to do is wait for that to download, wait for it to install, and you can go ahead and start using it for the rest of this course. But like I said, you don't need to use this text editor. That's just the one that I'm gonna be using and I wanted to give you guys kind of an option if you don't you know, really have a preference. But you know what you should do is find a text editor that you're gonna be comfortable with going forward, especially if you're gonna be writing a lot of code. So yeah, that's kind of you know the basics of choosing a text editor. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully you guys can find a text editor that you can use for the rest of this course. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how to get your first PHP file up and running. So we're gonna set everything up that we need to set up We'll create a PHP file and then we'll actually print something out onto the screen so we can make sure everything is working correctly. So let's get started. The first thing that we have to do when we're working with PHP is we actually have to start something called a PHP server. Now basically when we want to use PHP, we have to run PHP on a web server. So PHP is what's called a server side language basically means it's a programming language that's gonna run on a web server. And we can use PHP on that web server in order to interact with our websites. So your website is basically just a collection of files that gets given to the user. And we can write PHP on the web server, which is going to handle like giving out files to users or getting input from users and, and doing stuff like that. So basically all you need to know is that PHP is gonna run on a web server. And you don't really need to understand any more than that just as a beginner to PHP. And I'm gonna show you guys how we can set up our very own web server. And actually a web server comes with PHP, so it's really easy. So what I wanna do is I wanna open up my terminal or my command prompt. Now, if you're on Mac, it's gonna be called the terminal. If you're on Windows, it's gonna be called the command prompt. Um, and then I'm just gonna come down here and uh, just search for the command prompt. I'm gonna search CMD because I'm on Windows. If you're on Mac, just search for terminal and I'm gonna open this up. And the command prompt and the terminal are basically just two programs which will allow us to interact with the computer using text commands. That's essentially all you need to know. And over here, we're actually gonna start a web server. So you can just type in PHP and I'm gonna type hyphen a capital S and then I'm just gonna type localhost colon 4000. And then I'm gonna click enter. Essentially what we're doing here is we're creating a web server. So we're using PHP and PHP is gonna create like a little web server for us. And as a beginner to PHP, this is essentially all you need. So we can use this server that PHP is gonna create for us in order to run our PHP files. Um, you can actually use a different web server if you want. Setting up a like another web server on your computer is gonna take a, a while and you're gonna have to do a bunch of configuration, you're gonna have to download a bunch of things. So as a beginner, the easiest way to get started is to just use this PHP hyphen capital S localhost 4000 command. And you'll see over here, it basically just says PHP 7.1.11 development server started. So this is like a little web server that we can use and you'll see over here it says listening on HTTP localhost 4000. So localhost is, it's essentially just like the web address of your local computer. And this basically just means that we have a web server running on our local machine and it's running on port 4000. And then down here you'll see it says document root is C backslash users backslash Mike D. Now, if you're on OS X, this might be different. It's probably still gonna be like users and then your username. So that's basically where PHP is gonna start looking for uh, files that we're gonna run. So now that we have our server set up, you wanna just leave this running. So don't exit out of this window. I'm just gonna minimize it, but make sure that you don't exit out of it. 
And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here in my file explorer and I'm gonna go to that document root. So if you remember, it was users um, and then my username. So I'm just gonna go down here and we'll go to users and then Mike D. So this is where that document root was. In other words, this is where PHP is gonna start looking for files that we wanna run. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna create a new folder here. So I'm just gonna click new folder and I'm just gonna call this folder um, www. So www is just gonna stand for like our website. You can name it whatever you want, but I'm just gonna name mine www. And now what I wanna do once I have this www folder created is I wanna create a PHP file. And to do that, I'm actually gonna open up my text editor. So over here, I'm gonna open up Atom, which is the text editor that we installed in the last tutorial. And if you're not using Atom, then you can just use whatever um, text editor that you want. It doesn't really matter. And in here, I'm basically going to import this folder. So I'm just gonna come up and say file, and I'm gonna say add project folder. And now we're just gonna go to users, Mike D, and then we're gonna add this www folder. And this is basically just gonna let me um, see it while we're developing. So I'm gonna click select folder, so now we have www over here in our little navigation window. And I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna click new file and we wanna create a PHP file. So I'm just gonna create a PHP file and I'm just gonna call it site.php. And you can name this whatever you want, it doesn't matter what you name it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna name this site and you need to have this .php extension. So I'm gonna just gonna click enter and this file is gonna go ahead and get created for us. So once we have this file open, now we can start writing some code. Now here's the thing about PHP is PHP is very tightly coupled with a language called HTML. And HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It's basically a language that we can use to um, build websites. So if you've ever built a website before, then you've used HTML. Now, in order to program in PHP, in order to really get everything you can out of PHP, you're gonna wanna have a good understanding of HTML. By no means do you have to be an expert at HTML, but you should at least understand like what HTML is and how it works and sort of what's going on. I'm just gonna kinda assume that you guys have a basic knowledge of HTML. And if you don't know anything about HTML, we actually have an entire course on it in here on Draft Academy, so you can check that out. But for this course, I'm just gonna assume that you already understand the basics of HTML. So I'm not gonna be going over HTML basics. I'm just gonna assume that you know it. So this PHP file over here, site.php, this is actually very similar to an HTML file. So essentially we can write HTML inside of this file and it's gonna work just like it would work with a normal HTML file. For all intents and purposes, a PHP file and an HTML file are the same. It's just that in a PHP file, we can write PHP code, but everything else is pretty much the same, so it'll work the same. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna come over here and just set up a basic HTML skeleton. So here we just have this very basic skeleton for an HTML page, and inside of this HTML page, we're actually gonna write our PHP code. So whenever we wanna write PHP code inside of an HTML file, we can actually just come down here and I'm just gonna come down here into the body and we can create special PHP tags. So everything in HTML is a tag, right? So anytime that you're like laying out something or you're doing something, generally you're doing it inside of a tag and we can create a PHP tag and inside of that PHP tag, we can write our PHP code. So a PHP tag is very simple. I'm just gonna make a less than sign. I'm gonna make a question mark and I'm gonna type out PHP and then I'm just gonna make a couple new lines and you'll see down here we need a question mark and a greater than sign to end it off. So anything that I put in, inside of these tags is gonna be considered PHP code, all right? And I'm just gonna show you guys one simple PHP instruction that we can write. And then in the next tor tutorial, we're gonna look at some more instructions. But I just wanna show you guys like how we can basically set this up and make sure that everything's working. I'm just gonna type out echo and I'm gonna make an open and close parentheses and I'm gonna type a semicolon after this. And in here, I'm gonna make an open and close quotation marks and I'm just gonna type out hello world. So I'm saying echo, hello world, and this is actually a PHP instruction. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna print something out onto the screen. So what we can do now is we can save this file and remember over here, I still have my PHP server running 
and it's saying document root is users Mike D and it has this address up here localhost 4000. I'm going to go ahead and copy this and we're going to put this into our web browser. So I'm going to open up my web browser. In my case, I just have Google Chrome and over here in the address bar, I'm going to put in localhost 4000. Now, when we click enter, you'll notice that it says not found. And that's because there's no PHP files here at the root directory. But if you remember, we stored our PHP file in that www folder. So I can just make a forward slash www and then I can say forward slash and I'm going to type in the name of the PHP file. So it was site.php. And so now we're navigating to the folder where we're storing all of our files and then I'm typing in the file name and now when I click enter, it should bring us over here to this page. And you'll see when I go to site.php, it's printing out onto the screen, hello world. So basically we have successfully run our first PHP program. We have everything set up and we're ready to start working some more. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how you can use the echo command in PHP to write HTML from inside of your PHP code. So this is going to be kind of cool. Now, in the last tutorial, I showed you guys this very basic PHP command called echo. And we basically just typed out echo and open and close parentheses and open and close quotation mark. And then we typed out hello world. And then finally, we ended this off with a semicolon. And when I, was, when I went over here and refreshed my browser, we saw that hello world showed up over here. And that's kind of just like a super basic line of code. So I'm gonna actually show you guys um, sort of what this does and we're gonna break it down. So echo is basically a command in PHP, which allows us to write information out onto the HTML document. So if I was to come over here and I viewed the page source of this HTML document, you'll see over here that we're actually printing out hello world inside of the actual document. So when I came over here and I said echo hello world, this line of text got printed out inside of our HTML file. And that's basically what that echo command does is it, al it allows us to write HTML out to our HTML files. And that's kind of cool. So basically the way the echo command works is I just say echo and I can put these open and close parentheses and then I can just basically type out whatever HTML I want to put onto the screen. And then after this line of code, I'm going to put this semicolon and that semicolon is actually really important. Anytime we write a line of code in PHP, we want to make sure that we include that semicolon. And actually with this echo command, if I wanted, I could get rid of these um, parentheses and you could just leave it like this. So I could either use it like this or I could use it with parentheses around it. So I'm going to show you guys some cool stuff we can do with this echo command. In addition to just typing out regular text, I could also type out HTML code inside of these quotation marks. So for example, let's say I wanted to print out a header for my website. I could go in here and just type out H1 and I could say like Mike's site and then I could end off this H1. And now when I run my um, website over here, when I refresh the page, you'll see that this is actually getting rendered as an H1. And if we came over here and refreshed this uh, source, you'll see that an H1 is actually getting put onto the page over here. So not only was I typing out text, but I was also typing out HTML. And that's one of the cool things about this echo command is essentially inside of these quotation marks, I could put any valid HTML that I want and it'll actually get rendered over there on the browser. So this is really cool. And if I wanted, I could just like make another one of these. So we could come down here and we could say echo and now I could make like a paragraph, for example. So I could say like, this is my site and we'll end this off. And actually, if I wanted, I could also put like a horizontal rule here. So I could say like HR. And then I also want to remember anytime I write out a line of code in PHP, I always want to put this semicolon here. So I'm going to put a semicolon there and a semicolon there. And that basically just tells PHP like, hey, we're done writing this line of code and now we're going to write another line of code. So now when I head over to my web browser, you guys will see that we're actually getting this little website. So it says like Mike site, we have the horizontal rule and then it says this is my site. So from inside that PHP code, we're actually able to write out an entire website. And if I wanted, I could, you know, include as much text or as much HTML in here as possible. 
And this is something that's gonna come in handy when we're using PHP. And as we go forward in this course, anytime I want to like print something out or show you guys something, I'm gonna be using this echo command to do it. And so real quick, I also wanna just talk to you guys about how this code gets executed. So whenever we um, request this website over here. So for example, whenever I like refresh this web page, essentially what's happening is the little web server that we set up is going to serve this page. So you'll see over here when I refresh the page, it comes over here and it's basically saying like um, www forward slash site dot PHP. So this web server is actually serving up this PHP page to us. And whenever we refresh that page over there, this PHP code is gonna get executed by that web server. So when I click the refresh button over here or when I navigate to this website, this web server is actually going to come down here and it's gonna go into these PHP blocks and it's gonna execute all of the PHP code that's inside of here. So when I request the page or when I refresh the page, all this code for our website is actually getting rendered. So the PHP code is gonna get executed and then this code is basically just gonna get placed into the file and then we'll have our finished HTML file. And that's kind of how it works. And whenever we specify these PHP instructions over here, they're gonna get executed in order. So you'll notice that on my website, it says Mike's site, then the horizontal rule, then the paragraph. And that's because that's the order that I specify these instructions. If I was to take this line and I moved it up here above the header one, now this is gonna show up first. And that's because PHP is going to execute these instructions in order. So it's gonna execute this instruction, then this instruction, then this instruction. And so over here on our website, you'll see now that this paragraph is actually showing up above this header one. And that's because we changed the order of the code. So this is really just like the bare basics of PHP. Basically any of the PHP that we put in here, when the user requests this web page, so when the user requests site.php, this PHP code is gonna get executed and this file is gonna get put together. So it's basically going to render the PHP file that we see over here on the browser with all of these HTML tags. And then we'll be able to see like the finished product. So that's sort of the basics. And you'll see down here, we're, we're just using these simple instructions. So I'm using this echo instruction. But as we go through this course, we're gonna learn more and more complex instructions, which are gonna allow us to do more and more complex things. So I'm really excited to show you guys some more stuff we can do in PHP. And in the next tutorial, we're going to be looking into another way that we can leverage the power of PHP on our website. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about variables in PHP. Now, a lot of times in our PHP programs, we're gonna be dealing with all sorts of data and information. And a lot of times we're gonna to wanna to be able to maintain and keep track of that data in our programs. And we can actually use variables in order to do that. So in this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys the basics of working with variables and using variables. And we're gonna kind of get up to speed with uh, what variables are. So down here in my PHP tags, I have this very simple program set up. And it's basically just um, echoing out a bunch of text onto the screen. So it's saying there once was a man named George he was 70 years old. He really liked the name George, but didn't like being 70. So this is basically like a little story that I wrote and all this program does is write that story out onto the screen. So you can see over here on my browser, it just is printing out that story. So everything works. This is a valid program, right? Um, you'll notice that it's, it's very simple, but let's say that inside of my story, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I think I wanna change the character's name. Well, in order to do that, I can basically just go into my story and every place the character's name is mentioned, I can just change it. So let's say instead of being named George, I want the character to be named John. So I'm gonna come over here and we'll change this to John and we can change this down here to John as well. So now I've successfully updated the character's name, right? So every place in the story where the character's name was mentioned, I updated it to the new value. And let's say that I'm looking at my story again and I'm thinking, hmm, I think I also wanna change the character's name. Well, I could basically do the same thing, right? I could head down here and everywhere the character's age is mentioned, I can change it. So why don't we change the character's age to be a little younger, maybe 35, right? So I'll change it up here and then I'll also change it down here. So now 
I have updated the character's name and I've updated the character's age inside of my program. So now if we were to refresh the page, you'll see that all of that information got updated in the story, right? So, so that works perfectly, right? It makes sense. Um, but here's the problem though. In order for me to change the character's name and for me to change the character's age, I had to go through and manually modify both of those attributes, right? I had to manually go in here and change the name in both of these spots and I had to do the same thing for the age. And this is fine for a story with four lines, right? But imagine that this story was like hundreds of lines and we mentioned the character's name hundreds of times and we mentioned the character's age hundreds of times. Well, having to go in and manually change their name or manually change their age if I wanted to update it would be extremely tedious and difficult, right? And I would probably make a mistake somewhere, you know, where I wouldn't catch it. And this is actually a situation where we can use something called a variable. So a lot of times in our programs, we're gonna have certain pieces of information or certain data values that we wanna keep track of and we want to sort of organize. And in this case, we have two pieces of information, the character's name and the character's age. So what we can do is we can actually take these values and we can store them in something called a variable. And a variable is basically just a container where we can store pieces of information in our program. So I could create a variable and then I could store the character's age and the character's name inside of it. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna create two variables, one for the name and one for the age. And I'm just gonna come over here and right above this echo instruction, I'm gonna make a new instruction. And basically we're gonna create a variable, which again is just a container. Now, anytime you wanna create a variable in PHP, the first thing we have to do is type in this dollar sign. So whenever you type a dollar sign like that, it's basically telling PHP that you wanna create a variable. So after the dollar sign, we wanna name our variables. So remember, a variable is just a container where we're storing a piece of information. So what I wanna do is I wanna give this variable a descriptive name, which will tell me what piece of information is stored inside of it. So in our case, I'm gonna call this character name because it's gonna store the character's name. So I'm just gonna say character name. And now that I've given this a name, I wanna give this a value. So I can just say character name and I can just say equals and I'm gonna make these quotation marks and I'm just gonna type out the character's name, John. And then like always, I'm gonna put a semicolon there to end off the instruction. And so down below here, we also wanna make another variable. So we also, in addition to storing the character's name, John, we also wanna store their age. So once again, I'm just gonna type a dollar sign and now I'm gonna call this variable character age and I'm gonna set this equal to the character's age which is gonna be 35. So you'll notice over here when I wanted to store text inside of a variable I had to use these quotation marks and when I wanted to store a number inside of a variable I could just type out the number like that and that's kind of different ways that we can store information. So now that we've stored the character's name and the character's age inside of variables what I can do is I can actually replace every instance of the character's name and age inside of the story with that variable. And you'll see in a second why that can be useful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here to my story and um, over here, for example, we're typing out the character's name. So instead of having to type out John, what I could actually do is I could get rid of this and inside of this little string of text here, I could just type a dollar sign and now I can type in the name of the variable that I wanna place inside of here. So I could just type out character name and you'll see that this is actually getting highlighted a different color. And basically when we put this dollar sign and we type out the variable name here in this text, so in between these quotation marks, this is telling PHP that we wanna insert the value that's stored inside of this variable into our little print statement here. So now if I was to come over here and I was to refresh the web page, you'll see that we're still printing out there once was a man named John, but we didn't actually type out John. Remember, all we did was we just included this variable name over here in the story. And it was actually able to show up over here on the website. And so what PHP did was it saw that we wanted to include the value of the character name variable inside of here. And it went up, grabbed the value and basically just inserted it here into our story. So we can actually do that now 
for every occurrence of the character's name. So I could come down here and I could do the same thing. So I'm gonna say character name and we can do the same for the character's age. So down here we have character's age. So I'm just gonna type in character age and then over here we can do the same thing. So I'm just gonna do character age. And so now, even though I'm not physically typing out 35 and John, these are still gonna show up in my story. So you'll see over here, we get the same exact thing. It's still using the name John and it's still using the age 35. So what's useful about these variables is that they allow us to store and manage these different values in our programs, these different pieces of information that we're using in our programs. So let's say that now I wanted to update the character's name. Instead of having to go through and manually change it in all the places in my story, I can actually just come up here and I can modify it. So let's say I wanted to change the character's name to Tom. Well, I could just type Tom over here in one spot. So I changed the variable in one place and now it's gonna automatically be updated throughout my story. So now when I refresh my program, you'll see instead of using the name John, it's using the name Tom. I could do the same thing for the age. So why don't we make him 80 years old? And now Tom is gonna be 80 years old over here in my program. So that is a really awesome way that we can maintain and keep track of the different pieces of information in our programs. And really the point is that I can use this character name variable and then if I wanna change the value, I just change it up here when I assign it a value. And another cool thing that we can do with these variables is we can actually modify them throughout our program. So let's say that halfway through this story, I wanted to change the character's name. What I could do is I could actually come down here and I'm gonna make a new line. And let's say halfway through the story, we'll change the character's name. I could just say dollar sign character name and I could just give this a new value. So I could just give this the value of like Mike, for example. And now halfway through our story, the character's name is gonna change from Tom to Mike. So you'll see over here, the first part of the story, it's using the name Tom. And the second part of the story, it's using the name Mike. And basically you can just update these variables as you go through your program. You can like change their values and, and do different things with them. So that's kind of the basics of variables. Variables are containers where we can store different pieces of information that we wanna keep track of in our program. Now you'll notice that not all pieces of information are gonna get stored in variables. So for example, I didn't store like the word once or the word man inside of a variable, right? I stored the pieces of information that I was using multiple times throughout my program, like the character's name and the character's age. These are both values that I could store about the character, and therefore I put them in variables in order to make them easier to use. And then whenever I wanted to access those values, I just referred to the variable's name instead of having to like physically type out the value. So that's really the basics of variables. And you'll see over here, we're able to um, store like text inside of variables. We're also, we're also able to store numbers inside of variables. And there's also some other different types of data that we can store and represent and work with in PHP. And in the next tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys all about the different data types that we can represent in PHP. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about data types in PHP. Now in PHP, we're gonna be working with all different types of information. And as we you know, go forward in the course and we start writing more and more complex programs, we're gonna be dealing with all different types of information and data. So in this tutorial, I just kinda of wanna to talk to you guys about the different types of data that we can work with and represent inside of our PHP programs. And it's actually pretty simple. So down here in these little PHP tags, I'm actually just gonna be creating a couple different variables and we'll be storing different types of data inside of those variables. So the first type of data that we can work with and represent in PHP is what's called a string. And a string is basically just plain text. So anytime in PHP where we want to, you know, work with plain text, whether it's like a name or, you know, it could be like a location or a line in a book or, you know, anything that is plain text, we can use a string. So I'm going to create a variable over here. We'll just call it like phrase. And whenever I want to create a string, I'm always going to put an open and close quotation mark. 
So anytime that we're writing out a string or we're working with a string, it's gonna basically just be text inside of these open and close quotation marks. And anytime you have the quotation marks there, PHP is gonna know like, hey, this is gonna be a string. So I could just put a phrase like to be or not to be, right? So this is just any text that I wanna store uh, or work with or represent in my program can be a string like this. In addition to plain text, we can also represent numbers and there's two basic types of numbers in PHP. There's uh, whole numbers and then there's decimal numbers. And PHP has special names for these. Um, the first is gonna be an integer. So an integer is basically gonna be a whole number. And so those are just like counting numbers, like one, two, three, four, five. It's essentially just a number without a decimal point. So if I was to store someone's age inside of a variable, I can make this a number. And with numbers, all you have to do is just type out the number. So let's say someone was like 30 years old. I can just type out 30 here. I don't need quotation marks. I can just put the number here. And with numbers in PHP, you can also make them negative. So I can make this a negative number. Um, but you'll notice here, this number doesn't have a decimal point. So there's no decimal point, you know, with like a bunch of numbers after it. Um, it's just a whole number. And this is what we would refer to as an integer. And it's important to know the difference between um, decimal numbers and integers because PHP is actually gonna distinguish between them. So just know that anytime you have a number without a decimal point, it's an integer. We can also use a decimal number. Um, sometimes people will call these floating point numbers or they'll just call them like floats. And these are pretty straightforward. It's any number with a decimal point. So maybe we could store someone's GPA. So let's say their GPA was like a 3.7, right? Or it could even be like a 3.0 or 2.0. 98743, you know, basically any decimal number that you want to work with and represent in PHP. And this is, like I said, it's a lot of people will call these like floating point numbers or decimal numbers, but it is important to distinguish between these two. So there's a big difference in PHP between 30 and 30.0. There is going to be a difference between the two of those. This one obviously being a decimal. All right, so there's one more um, data type, one more main data type that we can work with and sort of uh, represent in PHP, which is called a Boolean. And a Boolean is basically a true or a false value. So this is probably a little bit less intuitive than these guys over here, like text and numbers, that's pretty obvious. But a lot of times when we're programming, we're gonna wanna represent and work with uh, true or false data. So we're gonna to wanna to be able to store like uh, true or false information and we can store that in something called a Boolean. So I'm gonna create a Boolean variable and why don't we call this like is male? So this variable could tell us whether or not someone's a male. And I could either set this equal to true if they're a male or I could set this equal to false. So anytime we have a Boolean variable or anytime you're representing a Boolean value, it can only be one of two things, either true or false. It's like a binary data type. And this is gonna come in handy a lot in PHP and we'll kind of get into you know how booleans are useful more later in the course but for now just know that you can store a true or a false value inside of a boolean so there's one more data type I guess it's kind of a data type um, it's basically a value that you'll see sometimes in PHP and it's the null value so anytime you see null like this in PHP this basically stands for no value and a lot of times in PHP, we're gonna kind of go out of our way to say something has no value. So sometimes you'll see like maybe an error message or you'll try to print something out and it'll basically just say null. And that's because it has no value. So anytime something has no value, PHP will denote that using this null keyword. So these are really the basic data types. And as we go through this course and really as you go through your PHP journey, I'd say 99% of the time, you're just gonna be using these data types. So you're just gonna be representing information in the form of text, numbers, or Booleans. And really with just this information, you can you know, essentially build any program that you want. And I also do just wanna point out that, you know, we don't always have to store this information inside of variables. So if I was to come down here, I could just echo out like a string. So I, over here, I'm printing out a string onto the browser. So over here, it says like, hello, right? I could do the same thing for a number. So I could just put a number down here, like 4.57, and it's gonna be the same thing. So, you know, you don't always have to store these things in variables. Although if you wanted, we could like, you know, I could print out like this phrase variable, and this is gonna get printed out onto the screen as well. 
So that's kind of the basics of, you know, different data types in PHP. And really, you know, these are data types that you're going to be seeing as we go forward in the course. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys an introduction into what they were and how we can use them. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys the ins and outs of working with strings in PHP. Now, a lot of times when you're writing your PHP code, one of the most common data types, one of the most common types of information that we're going to be working with is going to be strings. And strings are basically just plain text. So anytime in your PHP program where you want to represent or use plain text, you're going to be working with strings. So in this tutorial, I'm going to just show you guys a broad overview of how to use strings and all the different things that we can do with them. So let's get started down here in my PHP tags. Um, I want to show you guys basically how we could print out a string. So I could just say like echo. And then whenever I create a string, I always want to make these open and close quotation marks. And then in here I could type anything. So I could just type like draft Academy. And now when I refresh my browser, this is going to get printed out over here. So this is a string. This is plain text. And really, you know, this can just be anything you want. So any plain text that you want to represent or use can be placed inside of a string. And in addition to just printing out the string over here directly, we could also store a string inside of a variable. A variable is basically just a container that will allow us to manage that string a lot easier. So I could come over here, we could call this like phrase and I could set this equal to this string over here. And now if I wanted to print this out, instead of printing out the actual string, I could just print out the variable and this will print out the value that's stored inside of that variable. So you can see over here, we're still getting draft Academy. Now strings can be very cool. And when we're writing our PHP code, there's actually these little things called functions, which we can use to find out information about and modify our strings. So I could use one of these functions in order to do special things with the strings in my program. And I'm going to show you guys a couple of those string functions, which we can use. So down here in this little echo command, I'm going to go ahead and use one of these string functions. And like I said, these are basically just like little snippets of code that we can call and they'll do something to the string. So they'll give us some information about the string or they'll like modify the string in some way. So I'm gonna show you guys a couple of those and you can just kind of like see how they work. Um, one is going to allow us to convert this to either all uppercase or all lowercase. So in certain circumstances in your programs, you're gonna to wanna to make the string upper or lowercase and we can do that. So I could just say str to lower and then I'm gonna make an open and close parentheses and I'm actually going to surround the string with these open and closed parentheses. So I'm saying str to lower, open and closed parentheses, and then inside of these parentheses, we're putting this variable. And now what you'll see is when I refresh my browser, this is actually all lowercase now. So you can see it converted entirely into lowercase. We could also do the same thing for upper. So I could say string to upper, and now this will convert it entirely into uppercase. So you can see now we just get draft academy all uppers. And you don't just have to pass a variable in here. I could pass anything I wanted in here. So if I passed in like dog, now this will print out dog in all uppercase like that. And so that's kind of like a useful way to, you know, take a string that you have in your program and convert it to upper or lowercase. There's another one of these little functions which will tell us how many characters are inside of the string. So I could say str len. So this stands for string length. And this will tell us how many characters are in that string. So over here we get 15 because there's 15 characters in draft Academy. And a lot of times in our programs that will come in handy, we'll be able to figure out like how many characters are inside of a string. Another thing we can do is we can actually find out um, what the different characters of the, of the string are. So over here, I have this string draft Academy, right? It's storing the text draft Academy inside of it. Let's say that I wanted to figure out what the first character in this string was. So I wanted to figure out like, what's the first character in the string? Well, I could actually come over here and I'm going to get rid of this string length. So you'll notice I just erased all of that. And over here, after I type out the variable name, I'm going to type an open and closed square bracket, just like that. So right after the string, I'm going to type this open and closed square bracket. And in here, I can put what's called an index. And the index is basically going to refer to a specific character in the string. So let's say I wanted to figure out what the first character in the string was. I could actually put a zero in here. And this is now going to print out the first character in this string. So you see when I refresh my page over here, we get this G 
because that's the first character in the string. If I wanted to print out the second character in the string, I could come down here and say phrase square brackets one. And now I'm gonna get that I because I is the second character in the string. So whenever we're using these square brackets, like I said, we can put an index in here and it'll tell us what character is at that index position in the string. And whenever we have a string like this in PHP, we're gonna start at the indexing off at zero. So I would say that this first character G is at index position zero in the string. The second character I is at index position one, R is at two, A3, F4, etc. So when we start indexing these strings, in other words, when I assign index positions to the characters in the string, we always start at zero. So that's why down here, when I said phrase zero, this printed out that G. And also I can do this with things other than just a variable. So again, if I came down here and I just like printed out my name, this will tell me what the first character in that string was. So we're gonna get this capital M. Another thing we can do is we can actually modify individual indexes in the string. So I could actually come down here and I could say like phrase, and I could say like phrase zero is equal to, and I could change this to a B. And now if I was to just print out the phrase, it's going to actually replace phrase zero with B. So now it's gonna say Baraf Academy instead of Draft Academy. And that can be really useful. So you can actually modify like individual characters inside of your string. All right, so I wanna show you guys uh, a couple more of these little string functions, these little things that we can do to modify these strings. And um, another one is actually going to allow us to replace uh, certain substrings within our string. So over here I have this phrase variable and it has this string and I could actually replace like the word draft with another word if I wanted to. So let's say instead of it calling this draft academy, we wanted to call this like panda academy. Well, there's another one of these little functions which will allow us to do that. So down here, I'm just gonna type str underscore replace. And this stands for string replace. And over here, the first thing I'm gonna put inside of these open and close parentheses is going to be the substring that I wanna replace. So I'm gonna put draft inside of here. So I can just say draft, and then over here, I wanna put what I wanna replace it with. So we could put panda, and then finally, we're gonna put one more thing in here, which is gonna be the actual string where we want to do this. So I can just say phrase. And now, this is gonna replace the occurrence of draft with panda in the phrase string. So over here, I can just run this program and you can see now it says Panda Academy instead of Draft Academy. And you could really do this with anything. So I could say like, you know, just FFE, for example, and then we could replace that with Panda. And now it's gonna be like this, you know, weird word over here that we get. So that string replace can be really useful. And there'll be a lot of circumstances where you might want to like replace a certain character or a certain sequence of characters with another sequence of characters. So finally, there's one more of these that I wanna show you guys, and it's basically um, going to allow us to get like a substring. So over here, I could just type out substr, and basically this is gonna allow us to just grab like a section of this overall string over here. So I could just grab like a single word from it, or I could grab just like a couple different characters, and this will allow us to do that. So I'm gonna make an open and close parentheses after I say substring, and now inside of here, I want to pass a couple different um, pieces of information. So I can come over here. The first thing I'm gonna do is type out the string that I wanna get the substring from. Then I'm gonna type a comma. And over here, we can type a starting index. So this will basically be the index where we wanna start grabbing uh, the substring from. So remember, I have all of these different characters in this string have indexes. So like this is index position zero, one, two, three, et cetera. Let's say that we wanted to use this substring function to grab this academy word over here. Well, the first thing I need to do is figure out at what index academy starts. So we could actually just start counting. It's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I put an eight right here, now this is gonna grab a substring from this string starting at index position eight and going to the end. So we should just get academy. And you can see over here, we just get academy. I could also put another number in here, which is gonna be a length. And this will basically say how many characters we wanna grab. So if I said like three in here, for example, this is gonna grab one, two, three characters. So it's gonna grab ACA and then it's gonna stop. So over here, 
we can get this little substring just ACA. And this little function can come in handy quite a bit. So that's sort of just some basic um, string functions that you guys can use in PHP. And to be honest with you, there's a lot more of these. You know, I could spend like a couple hours just going through each of the functions and what they do. But really what I wanted to do in this tutorial was just kind of expose you guys to what this stuff is and expose you to, you know, some different ways that we can work with and modify strings. If you'd like to find out more about these string functions, you can basically just type into Google like PHP string functions and there'll be like a huge list of all of these awesome string functions that you guys can use. But for this tutorial, I think that's good and it gives you guys a little introduction into how to use it. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys the ins and outs of working with numbers in PHP. Now, one of the most important data types in PHP is numbers. And a lot of times in our programs, we're gonna be working with and doing different things with numbers. So I really just wanna give you guys a full introduction into um, what we can do with numbers, how we can use them in PHP. And I'm also gonna show you guys some little cool math operations that PHP is going to allow us to do by default. So this is gonna be pretty cool. And down here in my PHP tags, I'll just sort of show you guys the bare basics. So I could basically just like, if I wanted to, I could print out a number. And whenever we're typing out a number in PHP, you can just type it out. You don't need to use any quotation marks. You don't need to use any like special characters. You just type out the number and like this will show up over here on the screen. So we get 40. PHP can also handle negative numbers. So I could make a negative number just like that. I could also make a decimal number. So I could say like, um, you know, eight, four, seven or something. And now we have like a negative decimal number. And it's important that you understand the two distinct types of numbers. So in PHP is going to um, differentiate between the two um, a little bit. So this, for example, like 40 would be a whole number. It doesn't have a decimal point. So this is like what we would call an integer number. Um, but then over here, if I put a decimal point on here, uh, now all of a sudden this is what we would call a floating point number or a decimal number. So this just has decimal points after it. So you wanna just make sure that you're aware of the difference between those two types of numbers. Honestly, it's not going to like affect anything that much, but just so you're aware that there are those two distinct types of numbers. All right, so in addition to just like printing out a number over here, I could also do arithmetic. So I could perform like math operations. So I could say like echo five, plus nine. And now instead of echoing five plus nine, this is actually going to echo out the answer of five plus nine. So it's gonna go ahead and add both of these together and over here we should get 14. So you can see PHP actually solved this little math equation that we gave it. So we can use addition, we could also use subtraction, which is just the hyphen. We could use division, which is gonna be this forward slash, and we could use multiplication, which is gonna be the asterisk. So I could go ahead and multiply like, 5.7 times nine. And over here we should get 51.3. So PHP is basically able to do, you know, any math that we throw at it. There's also one other operator that I wanted to show you guys. It's called the modulus operator. So I could say like 10 percent sign three, and we would read this as 10 mod three. And basically what this means is um, modulus operator is gonna take 10, it's gonna divide it by three, and it's gonna give us the remainder. So 10 divided by three is gonna be three with a remainder of one. So over here on the browser, we should get one, which you can see we do. So this is a pretty useful little operation. And there will be certain circumstances where you wanna find out the remainder of a division. Another thing I wanna show you guys is order of operations. So PHP is going to allow us to specify order of operations. So for example, if I said like four plus five, times 10. What this is gonna do is it's gonna multiply the numbers first. So it's gonna do five times 10 first, and then it's gonna add four onto it. So we should get 54, which you can see we do. Um, but let's say I wanted to do the addition first, I could just put parentheses around it. So I could say like four plus five in parentheses, and now PHP is gonna honor the order of operations. So we'll end up getting 90 because we're adding four and five, which is nine, and then we're multiplying that by 10. So this just follows normal order of operations rules. Um, if you're familiar with just like normal, you know, math order of operations, then it's the same thing. All right, so in addition to just storing a number or like printing out a number right here, we could also store a number inside of a variable. So over here, I could actually create a variable why don't we call this num and I could just set this equal to any number. So I could set it equal to like 10. So I could actually just print this num out. And now we're gonna be printing out 10 onto the screen. 
because it's going to print out the value that was stored inside of this number variable. There's also some things we can do. So a lot of times in PHP, you're going to want to increment a variable that has a number in it. So I could say like num and then I could say plus plus and plus plus is basically just going to add one onto num. So now down here, instead of printing out 10, we're actually gonna print out 11. And that's because we use this plus plus, which basically just adds one to the number. So over here, instead of getting 10, we're getting 11. You could do the same thing with minus minus. So this will subtract one from the number. So now because we have minus minus, we're gonna end up getting a nine instead of a 10. So that can be pretty useful. Another thing we can do is we can add a number onto this number. So I could say like num, and let's say I wanted to do something like num is equal to num plus 25, right? So basically over here, I'm saying that I want num to be equal to num plus 25. Well, this is actually gonna give us 35, so it'll do exactly what we think it's gonna do. But there's a shorthand for this. So I could actually just come over here and I could say num plus equals 25, and this is gonna do exactly the same thing. So now, we should get 35 all the same, which you can see we do. You could also use minus equals, divide equals, and multiplication equals. And basically like multiplication equals would just be the same as saying num times 25, right? It's basically doing the same thing, it's just a shorthand. All right, so all of that stuff can be pretty useful and it can be pretty fun to just kind of play around with that. Um, so another thing I wanna show you guys is how we can use math operations. So there's a lot of like more complex math operations that we might wanna do in our PHP programs. For example, instead of just doing like addition and subtraction, I might wanna like find a square root of a number or um, you know use exponents or you know do something more advanced, some more advanced math calculation. And there's actually these things in PHP called functions. And functions are basically just like little snippets of code that we can call, which will perform a specific operation for us. And we're gonna talk more about functions later in the course. But for now, just know that a function can basically like do something for us in our program. And there's a lot of math functions that we can use in PHP, which will perform math operations for us. So for example, let's say I wanted to find the absolute value of a number. Absolute value is just like, if the number is negative or positive, it's always just gonna give you like the value. So I could just say ABS, I can make an open and close parentheses, and inside of these parentheses, I could put a number. So I could put like negative 100, and this is actually gonna give me back the absolute value of 100. So if I was to print this out over here, you can see we just get 100 instead of negative 100. You can also do a bunch of other math operations. So for example, let's say we wanted to um, take a number to a power, like I wanted to do like two raised to the fourth power or something like that. We could say POW and in here I could just pass in a two and a four. And now this is gonna give us two raised to the fourth power. So over here we get 16. We could also do like kind of the opposite. So I could, instead of taking a number to a power, I could say, square root, so SQRT. And then in here I could pass a number, like if I passed 144, now we're gonna get 12 back. And you can see over here we do. So that can be, you know, that's an easy way to get a square root of a number. Another thing we could do is compare numbers. So I could actually come over here and I could say max. And when I say max, I can pass two numbers into this parentheses. So I could say like two, I'll separate it with a comma, and then I could say 10. And basically what this function is gonna do is it's gonna tell us which of these two numbers is bigger. So what it should do is it should just print out 10 because that's the bigger number. And you'll see over here we get 10. There's another one I can use which is called min. So I could say, instead of max, we could say min. And now this will do the opposite. So it'll tell me which number is smaller. So over here you can see now, instead of 10, we're getting two because two was the smaller of the numbers. So in addition to doing something like that, we could also round our numbers. So let's say I have like a decimal number and I wanna round it up or down. Um, I could just say round and in here I could just pass a number. So I could say like 3.2 and this will round it down to three. So it's gonna round according to just like standard rounding rules. Um, if I had like 3.7, now this will round it up to four. There's also two other functions. So one's called seal. And this is called the ceiling function. And basically, no matter what decimal point is over here, it's always gonna round it up. So no matter what, it's always just gonna round this number up. So you'll see here we get four 
even though this is a 3.3. And I could do the same thing um, in the other direction. So I could say floor. And now no matter what, this will round it down. So even if I had like a 3.9 over here, it's always gonna round this number down. So we're always gonna get three. So that's just kind of like a couple of these different math functions that you can use. And to be honest with you, there are dozens and dozens of these math functions that are available in PHP. I mean, there's all sorts of things to do things with like logarithms and you can do stuff with like sine, cosine, tangent, all that stuff. Um, I'm not gonna spend time going through every single one. If you'd like to find more of these math functions, you can basically just go online and search PHP math functions. There's a bunch of pages with you know full explanations on how to use all of these guys. But I really just wanted to give you guys an introduction into kind of like all these different operations that you can use and sort of like how you can go about using them. So hopefully you guys learned something. Um, you know, obviously working with numbers is extremely important and numbers is probably the most common type of data that we're gonna be working with in our programs. So you wanna make sure that you have a sort of solid understanding of how numbers work and how you can work with them. In this tutorial, I wanna show you guys how to get input from users in PHP. So a lot of times in our PHP programs, you know, we're gonna be dealing with all sorts of information and data, but a lot of times we're gonna to wanna to be able to get that information and that data from a user, right? Any good website is going to allow the user to be interacting with it, you know, filling out forms, doing all sorts of stuff um, on the website. So in PHP, we can actually get input from users um, that type information into things like text boxes or buttons or, you know, really anything like that. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can do that in PHP. Now in order to do this in PHP, we're actually gonna to need to do a couple things. The first thing we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to set up something called a form. Now, if you're familiar with HTML, then hopefully you have like a basic understanding of what a form is. But if not, I'm gonna go ahead and explain it to you guys. A form is basically a special HTML element that's going to allow the user to um, input information and then it'll be able to pass the information that the user enters over to our PHP programs. So the form is kind of like the middleman between HTML and PHP, right? So the form is where HTML and PHP meet and it's essentially just a way that PHP can get information from a user. So we can set up a form and then inside of that form, we can put like text boxes or radio buttons or you know submit buttons, really anything that we want. And then the user is gonna be able to interact with us and PHP will be able to get what the user enters. So this is gonna be kind of cool. And down here, I'm gonna show you guys how we can set up a basic HTML form. So I'm just gonna come over here and we're just gonna type out form and we need to give this some HTML attributes. So the first thing that I want to put in here is just the keyword action. And I'm just gonna say action is equal to and open and close quotation marks. And inside here, we're basically gonna put the name of the PHP page that we want to be able to handle this form. So in our case, I'm over here on my site.php file. And this is just the file that we've been using throughout this uh, course. And this is a file where I want to handle um, what happens with the form. So down here, I'm just gonna put the name of this page. So it's just site.php. So we're basically just put the name of the PHP page that we want to work with. And then over here, we're gonna make another one, which is gonna be called method. And this is essentially gonna tell this form uh, what we're trying to do with it. With this form, we're trying to get information from the user. Like the whole purpose of having this form here is that we want to be able to get information from the user and use it in our PHP code. So I'm just gonna put get right here and get is basically just gonna mean that we're trying to get information. So now I have the first part of this form and we wanna come down here and we're just gonna make a closing tag. So I'm just gonna close this form off. Now inside of this form, I can actually put some like text boxes. Basically I can put HTML elements that will allow the user to interact with the page. So, you know, something where they can type in or like a button that they can press. So over here, I'm gonna make an input. So I'm just gonna say input. And input is actually a special tag that can be used with these forms. And the input tag will allow the user to input information. And since it's like special, it'll work with the form in order to pass that information back to PHP. So over here, I can just say input and I wanna give this a type. And I'm just gonna say input type is equal to text. And this is just gonna give us a basic text box. 
And then over here, I wanna give this one more thing. We're gonna give this a name. And you wanna make sure that this is a, um, one, it's gonna be a name that's going to describe what type of content you're getting. And also this name needs to be unique. So let's say for the purposes of this tutorial and for the purposes of this program, why don't we ask the user to enter in their name? So I'll basically just prompt the user, tell them that they should enter in their name. So I'm actually just gonna call this name. And then finally, we can just end off this input tag. And then over here, I'm just gonna type in a prompt. So I'm basically just gonna type in name. And this will kind of like tell us what this um, text box is for. So now if I was to come over here and refresh my page, you guys will see that we have this text box and it's basically asking us for our name. So I could actually type into here and um, you know it'll allow me to input information. But we're not done. There's one more thing that we have to do and we have to put a submit button. So you know, once the user types in the information that they want, I want them to be able to click a button and then that information will basically get submitted. So what I'm gonna do down here is I'm gonna create a button. So I'm just gonna say input and type is gonna be equal to submit. So this submit button is special. It's basically just gonna submit all the information in the text boxes up here. So when I click this submit button, it's basically going to submit the information to PHP and we'll be able to you know, access all the information that got submitted in our PHP program. So over here, like I said, just type submit and then you'll see that we're getting this submit button down here. So now we have our HTML form set up. So we actually have everything set up on the HTML side. Now we need to go over into PHP and I'll show you guys how we can actually get access to all of the information that was entered in this form. So over here I have my little PHP tags and I'm actually just going to take these and I'm gonna move them down here below the form. So I'm gonna make like a break tag and I'm gonna put the PHP down here. And so what we can actually do now is inside of these PHP tags, we can access the information that got submitted when we click that submit button. So when I go over and I click that submit button, essentially what happens is that form gets submitted and we can access the information that got submitted inside of our PHP program. So what I can actually do is I can just say echo and remember, the echo command is just going to sort of echo something out into the HTML document. And what I wanna do is I wanna echo out the name that the user input, right? So remember, we gave this a name, it was just called name. And down here, I wanna echo out that information that got submitted. So what I can actually do is I can say echo, and I'm gonna make a dollar sign underscore, and I'm gonna type out G-E-T, and this stands for get. So this is basically gonna get the information that got submitted. And then I'm gonna make an open and closed square bracket. And inside of here, I'm gonna make quotation marks and I'm gonna type out the name of the input that I wanna grab. So you'll notice over here, this input tag for the name, I gave it a name called name, right? So this was its name. Down here, I can just type that in. And basically what this is gonna do now is it's gonna print out the value that got submitted inside of that text box. So if I was to come over here to my program, and I can come over here and just type in my name. So I'm just gonna type in Mike. Now when I click submit, what's gonna happen is the name that I submitted is gonna get echoed out onto the page. So let's click submit. And you'll see over here, it echoes out that value. So it echoes out Mike. And it was actually pretty easy, right? All we had to do was set up this form and then down here we said get and we passed in the name of the input tag. So I could make this whatever I wanted. I could change this to like username if I wanted and then down here I could change this to username and it's gonna do the same thing. So that name is pretty arbitrary, like it can be whatever you want it to be. It just has to match. So the name over here has to match the name up there. And so that's basically how we can get input from the user. We set up our form, we allow the user to enter in in that text box, and then when they click that submit button, essentially what happens is this field over here is gonna get populated with the user's name and we'll be able to print it out. So that's basically how this works. And if I wanted, I could actually come over here and I could print out like your name is and then it'll print out their name. So now it'll be like a little bit more of a um, explanation. So you'll see down here now it says like your name is ADSF. Um, but if I actually typed in my name like Mike, now it'll say your name is Mike. So 
essentially we're taking the information that we got from the form and we're sort of like interweaving it into our HTML document just like that. And you can really do this for as much information as you want. So obviously over here, we're just getting their name, but if I wanted, I could get another piece of information. So I could say like, let's ask them to enter in their age. And actually over here, we're gonna put a break tag. So I could say like enter your age and then again, we can just make another input and we can make this a number input because it's an age and I could call this age and then we can sort of like close this off. And then down here I could print out their name. So I'm actually just gonna copy this line up here and we can paste this down here. And I'm also gonna put a break tag here. And now instead of saying your name is, I could say like your age is, and then over here we can just print out their age. So now I can actually enter in two pieces of information, the name and the age. So over here, you know, we could say like someone's name is John and they're 30. And now it'll populate both of these fields with that information. So you can see we're getting John and 30. So that's sort of the basics of getting input from users. And you know, really this is just scratching the surface. Obviously you can get more complex with the types of information that you're getting and the amount of information that you're getting. But this basic concept is gonna apply in every aspect of PHP, right? We set up our form, we use this action, which is just gonna point to the like, current page. Um, and then we're using this get method. And then down here, when we wanna access that information that gets submitted, we can just say like dollar sign underscore get, and then the name of the input form that was submitted. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how to build a basic calculator in PHP. So we're basically gonna design a little program where the user can enter in two numbers, and then our program will add those two numbers together and print out the result. So it's gonna be a pretty simple calculator, but this should show you guys um, how we can get numbers from the user in PHP. So down here, I have a basic little program set up, and essentially in my HTML, I just have a form, and the action is set to site.php. And that's the name of the file that I'm currently on. And then over here we have the method as get. And in the last tutorial, I kind of explained what all of this was doing. And then finally down here, we have this submit button, which uh, is basically gonna submit the form so that we can access whatever the user entered in our PHP, which I've placed down here. So the first thing we need to do if we wanna build this calculator is we're gonna to need to get information from the user. So essentially we're gonna to need to get two numbers from the user, right? We're gonna to need to get those two numbers and then we can add them together and print out the result. So what we should do is we should actually create two inputs. So we're basically gonna create like two little um, input boxes where the user can enter in those numbers and then we can grab that information. So I'm gonna create two of these little inputs. I'm just gonna say input and I'm gonna say type is equal to, and in HTML, there's actually a special type we can use for numbers. So you can just say number. And so type equal to number is basically gonna make it so the user can only enter in a number. So they're not gonna be able to enter in um, text. And then over here, we can just give this a name. So I'm gonna say name is equal to, and we'll just call this num1. So this is gonna be the first number that they're gonna enter. Then we can just make like a break tag and then I'm gonna do this same exact thing. So I'm gonna copy this, and we're gonna go ahead and paste this down here. And again, the input type's gonna be a number, but I'm gonna call this one num2. So now we have input boxes for the first number and for the second number, and we have our submit button. So basically what's gonna happen is when I click that submit button, this information, the information inside of both of these uh, boxes, is going to get submitted and we'll be able to access it from within our PHP. So down here in the PHP, what I wanna actually do is I want to get access to those pieces of information, to num1 and num2. And essentially all I wanna do is add them together. So what I could do is I could actually just say echo and I'm basically just gonna echo out the uh, result of adding those two numbers together. So what we wanna do is we wanna get the first number and I can just say dollar sign underscore get in all caps and then I'm gonna make an open and close square bracket and inside of here, I'm just gonna say num1. And essentially what this is gonna do is it's gonna get whatever the user typed into that first number box and it's going to put it over here. And then what I wanna do is I wanna add num2 onto it. So I'm gonna put a plus sign here and I'm gonna essentially do the same exact thing. I'm gonna say dollar sign underscore get 
open and close square brackets, and we're gonna say num2. Essentially what we're saying here is I wanna echo out into the HTML num1 plus num2. And because both of these were entered in as numbers, in other words, because I said the type of input was gonna be a number, PHP will actually add these numbers together as if they were actual numbers. So if I put like two and three in there, we should get five. So this will go ahead and print out the answer. And then I'm just gonna come over here and I'll say answer, and then we'll be printing out the answer. So let's go over to our HTML or to my browser. I'll refresh the page. And you'll see over here, we have our two text boxes. We have our submit button. And then over here, it says the answer is zero. And that's basically just because we haven't entered in any numbers yet. So if I came over here and I said like 10, and then down here we said, uh, I don't know, 21. Now this will give us the result of adding those. So I'm gonna click submit, and down here it says 31. So that is essentially how we can go about adding two numbers together. Now I wanna show you guys um, one cool thing. So if I was to make this browser window a little bit bigger, you'll notice up here inside of the URL, we have these little line over here. It says num1 is equal to 10, ampersand num2 is equal to 21. And essentially what this is doing is it's telling us what the values of those variables were. So with PHP, this can actually get added onto the URL. So if I was to change this up here in the URL, like if I change num2 to like 50, and then I clicked enter, this is actually gonna change the information that gets entered in. So without having to type numbers inside of here, like without having to do anything, I was actually able to change what the answer was down here. And this is sort of a key concept in PHP. And I wanted to introduce it in this tutorial. Anytime that we're entering in information with that form, when the form gets submitted, the information that got submitted is gonna appear up here in the URL. And so essentially what's happening is when I load up this page, I can give these different pieces of information. So I say like num1 is equal to 100. And now since I said num1 is equal to 100 up here in the URL, it's going to take the value of num1 as 100. So when I click enter now, num1 becomes 100 and it adds those two numbers together. So like I said, whenever we submit that form, that information shows up up here. So if I was to get rid of this and I just hit enter, you'll notice that this whole form gets reset. But, but now if I put in like 40 and I put in 30 and click submit, it's essentially just adding these things onto the end of the URL, and this information is basically telling us what this answer is going to be. So that's sort of like how that works um, up there in the URL, and that's not like you know too important. Later in the course, we can actually leverage those URLs to do different things. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to talk more about that later. But I just wanted to kind of um, mention it so you guys aren't confused if you see that stuff up there in the URL. So. This program works pretty well and we're able to you know, add different numbers together. And this kind of shows you, um, instead of getting text, how we can get numbers and we can actually do math on those numbers in our PHP program. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how to build a Mad Libs game in PHP. Now, if you're not familiar with Mad Libs, it's basically a game where you can enter in like a bunch of random words, and then you'll take all those random words and kind of like sprinkle them in through a story. And usually because you entered in a bunch of random stuff, the story ends up being like pretty funny. Um, I actually have a picture over here in my browser. See, this is kind of just like a basic Mad Lib. Um, essentially, you're entering in different like parts of speech or different things like nouns or like a person or um, a place. And then all those things that you enter in will get, like I said, sprinkled in throughout a story. So we're gonna build something like this, just like a Mad Lib. Essentially, we're gonna allow the user to um, enter in a bunch of different words, and then we'll take those words and put them into our story. Down here, I have a little basic story set up. And it's basically just saying roses are red, violets are blue, I love you. So this is kind of like a classic poem, um, but I think it would be a lot better if we mad libbed it up and we allowed the user to enter in some you know, random stuff. So how about instead of saying roses are red, we let the user enter in a custom color. So this would just be like a color. Instead of saying violets are blue, why don't we let them enter in their own plural noun? So. And then finally, instead of saying, I love you, why don't we let them say, I love, and then some, 
celebrity. So I love celebrity. So now, um, instead of saying roses are red, violets are blue, I love you, it's gonna say roses are, and then the color that they enter, the plural noun that they enter are blue, and then I love the celebrity that they enter. So this should be kind of cool. And you can see just over here in my program, I'm printing it out. And in order to do this, we're actually gonna have to get information from the user. So we're gonna have to let the user um, enter in some words that they wanna use in the story. So up here I have this form already set up and it's just action site.php. This is the name of the PHP file that we're currently on and it says method get. And then down here I have a submit button. So this is a, a very basic form outline. And inside of this form, we want to basically prompt the user to enter in some information. So we're gonna have them enter in a color, a plural noun, and a celebrity. So I'm just gonna say color, and then over here we'll make an input tag, and type is gonna be equal to text, and we're gonna give this a name. So why don't we just call this color, and then I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm gonna make a break over here, and I'm basically just gonna copy this and we'll use this same thing for the plural noun and for the celebrity. So over here, we'll make this plural noun and we're just gonna call this plural noun. And then finally over here, we'll do the same thing for the celebrity. And again, we'll just call this celebrity instead of color. So essentially I have three input boxes, three text boxes, One's asking for a color, the other is asking for a plural noun, and the other one is asking for a celebrity. And you can see I gave them all names to match. So this one's name is color, plural noun, and celebrity. So we have our form set up, right? In other words, we have the prompts set up for the user to enter in that information. The last thing that we need to do now is we need to be able to get that information when they submit the form and put it into our story. So let's go down here to our story and I'm gonna show you guys how we can do that. So what I wanna do is I wanna create three variables and each one of these variables is actually gonna store the color, the plural noun, and the celebrity. And inside of these variables, we're gonna store the result of getting that information from the user. So I'm just gonna say color and I'm gonna set this equal to dollar sign underscore get, open and close square brackets, and then the name of that text box. So it was just color. And basically what's gonna happen is when the user submits the form, this variable is gonna get populated with whatever they entered in for the color. And we can do the same thing for the plural noun. So I'm just gonna call this plural noun, and this is gonna be equal to get, and here it's gonna be plural noun. And then finally, we're gonna do the same thing for the celebrity. So we're gonna say celebrity is equal to get, and we wanna get the celebrity. Then, now that we have these variables, we can just print them out inside of our story. So down here, instead of saying color, I can just say the color variable. So this will print out the value that's stored inside of the color variable. Same thing is gonna be for the plural noun. And then down here, we'll just say, plural noun, and then finally, we'll do the same for the celebrity. So essentially, I stored all of the things that the user input inside of these variables, and then down here, I'm actually going to print them out inside of the story. All right, so let's go ahead and test this out. I'm going to go over to my webpage. So you can see over here, we have all of this information set up now. And you'll see down here, this story is basically just printing out roses are blank, blank are blue, I love blank. And then over here, we can actually start submitting some information. So over here in color, I'm just gonna type in magenta, plural noun, why don't we do like microwaves, and then celebrity, let's do Tom Hanks. So now when I click submit, all of this information should get submitted and it's gonna get stored inside of each one of these variables. Then those variables are gonna get printed out inside of our story. So let's do that, I'm gonna click submit, and you'll see down here that our story updates. So it says, roses are magenta, microwaves are blue, I love Tom Hanks. So we were actually able to make this Mad Libs now. Now obviously the one problem with this Mad Libs is that um, you know if I was to like reset this form, this is like showing up here before we actually submitted the form. So ideally we would want this text to show up 
after we submit the form, like after the users entered in all the stuff and not before. Um, and actually later in the course, we're gonna learn a technique that we can use to do something like that. But for now, this kind of works. And you can see how, you know, we could essentially enter in whatever color, whatever plural noun, and whatever celebrity we wanted and it would show up inside of our story just like that. So hopefully that makes sense. And what you should do is just build your own Mad Libs game and you know you can model your own little Mad Libs story and sort of play around with it. In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about URL parameters in PHP. Now a URL parameter is basically just a value that we can tack on to the end of one of our URLs which will essentially pass a value into our PHP program and then we can access it. So I wanna show you guys basically how this works and um, what it's doing. So over here, I have a very simple program set up. I have this form over here. The action is site.php. That's the page that I'm currently working on. And then the method is get. And whenever we're using these URL parameters, you always wanna make sure that this says get right there. And actually in the next video, I'm gonna to talk to you guys some more about um, what get actually is doing. Um, and there's actually another method we can use called post. So if you're interested in like exactly what's going on here, check out the next tutorial. But for now, I just wanna to talk to you guys about these URL parameters. Um, so make sure that get is put over here. And then I basically am just asking the user to enter in their name. So I'm using this text box over here, telling them to enter in their name, and then we have a submit button. And then down here in my PHP, I'm basically just printing out the name onto the browser. So if I come over here, I can use this program. I could just like type in my name, Mike, and when I click submit, my name prints out down there on the page. Very simple. But one thing I wanna show you guys is when I expand my browser window over here, you notice that up here it says site.php question mark name is equal to Mike. So essentially what happened was when I submitted that form, the value for name actually got placed inside of our URL. And this is what we would call a URL parameter or a URL variable or a URL value. And basically what this means is this is just the piece of information that we're giving to PHP. So I could come over here and I could change this to like Dave. And now you'll see that the value updates down here. So without having to type in anything, like if I typed in a name up here, Steve, and I click submit, You'll notice that it updates down here and it also updates up here. But if I wanted, I could just bypass this text box altogether and I could pass a value in here like John and now that's gonna be the value that this page is getting. So up until this point in the course, we've always been getting our information through these text boxes. And that's a very common way to do it. A lot of times you're gonna want your user to interact with the website using things like text boxes or buttons. But other times in our PHP programs, you might wanna give information to your PHP page without having to like make the user do it. So in other words, in certain circumstances, like there might just be certain values that I wanna give in a specific URL and I don't necessarily want the user to have to enter them. And we can use these URL parameters in order to do that. So if I wanna add another URL parameter over here, you'll notice that we say essentially the name of the site then we use this question mark and that sort of delineates these two things. And then over here, I'm basically saying the name of the parameter or the name of the variable and then the value that we're giving to it. If I wanna add another one, I can just say ampersand and now I can do the same thing. So let's say we wanted to pass in like an age. I could say like age is equal to 70. So now in addition to giving this page this name value, I'm also giving it this age value over here with a value of 70. So if I was to come over here and I just like entered this in, you'll notice that like nothing's changing, right? Even though I added that new, you know, parameter up here in the URL, it doesn't really change anything on the page. But inside of our PHP, it's gonna change a lot. So I could actually access this value that got passed in in the URL. So I could come down here and instead of echoing um, the name, I could actually echo the age now. So because we passed in this variable age, I'm able to print out what it was. So instead of printing out the name now, when I enter this, it's gonna print out the age. So you can see we're printing out 70. And if I was to get rid of this up here in the URL, now it's just not gonna print out anything because it didn't receive that value. And this is a really awesome way for us to build these URLs. One of the reasons that this is so useful is because you could have a um, web page that's, you know, has a bunch of values associated with it, and then you could store all of those values in the URL. 
So a user could actually like bookmark that page and they could go back to that page with all of that same information set for the page. And you know, this doesn't have to be like someone's name or someone's age. I mean, this could be any information that you want to store on a particular web page. And like I said, because all of it's stored in the URL, uh, users can like bookmark that page and they can have all of that information stored. So a lot of websites will do something like this. For example, if I came over here and I like did a Google search. So if I just searched for like dogs, for example, when I hit enter, you'll notice that Google has something similar. So, you know, I don't know exactly what technology Google's using, but you'll see over here, Google has something similar to what we did over there. So they have like this ampersand, they have this little value here, AQS is equal to Chrome, dot, dot, whatever. So Google is doing similar things. Inside the Google URL, there's also information stored just like we had on our URL. So this can be kind of useful. Um, and obviously like, you know, Google's using this for some complex use case. Obviously we're just passing a name, but the concept is the same. We can store information inside of these URLs. Now here's one of the problems with something like this is that it's not very secure. So all of the information that we pass into this website is basically visible. So if I was to type in like my name over here and I click submit, the name that got passed in is that, you know, it's basically visible and available up here in the URL. And a lot of circumstances, you're gonna want it to be visible, like I said, for bookmarking or, or something else. But in other circumstances, you're not gonna want the user to be able to, you know, see this information or even be able to modify it. Like I could just modify this piece of information and it's going to change you know what happens on my website for a situation like that we can actually use another um form method so you'll notice up here inside of my form i have this little method attribute it says get um, there's another method called post which we can use which will basically do the same thing but in a more secure fashion and in the next tutorial i'm going to talk to you guys about what that post method can do and we'll just talk about the differences between get and post but for now, that's kind of been an explanation of those URL parameters. Um, and those are extremely useful, like I said, um, for any information that you just kind of want to be publicly available. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about two different ways that we can get information from users. Um, and basically, these are two form methods called get and post. And I'm just going to talk about the difference between the two of them and we'll kind of look at what they're doing and when you should use get and when you should use post. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, down here, I have a basic program set up. Basically, I have this form and all it's doing is asking the user for a password. So here I have this input and it's a type password and the name is called password, right? And whenever we put type password over here, this is actually gonna give us a text box, which like is a password. So you'll see over here in this text box, like when I type in it sort of like, you know, blocks it out. And that's basically just like, you know, you can see that a lot on different websites, just so nobody can see what you're typing in when you're typing in your password. And then obviously we have this submit button and then down here in the PHP, I'm just echoing out the password. So that way we can just like see what I enter in. So if I came over here, I could like enter in a password um, and then when I click submit, the password will show up down here. So I just, my password was WordPass. And I want to talk to you guys now about the different ways that we could get something like a password from the user. So over here and up to this point in this course, whenever we've been building these forms, we've always set this method equal to get. And basically when we set this method equal to get, what's going to happen is the information that the user enters is obviously it's going to get, you know, submitted into PHP and we're going to be able to use it. But that information is also going to get put up in the URL as a URL parameter. And a URL parameter is basically just, you know, a way that we can um, pass information into PHP. So when I use this get method, you'll see over here when I entered in my password, the password actually showed up up here inside of the URL. So if I was to enter in another password, like I'll enter another password, click submit, I entered in banana. And now because I used that get method over here, the password is actually showing up inside of the URL. Now I'm sure you can imagine like this is not a good scenario for a password. Certain information that we're passing into our 
PHP pages is going to be fine to show up there in the URL, right? It's not going to be a problem. Like it doesn't really matter with certain pieces of information, but with a password, if your password is actually showing up inside the URL, that is extremely insecure. And also I could come up here and I could change it. So I could change the password to like orange. And now the password is like updated throughout the entire page, right? So a piece of information like a password is not something that should be stored up there inside the URL. And it's not something that the user should just be able to change willy nilly whenever they want in the URL. In a situation like that, where we have information that we want to, you know, pass between the client and the server more securely, we want to use the post method. So down here, instead of saying get, I'm actually just going to say post. And just with that one change, this is actually going to update. So down here, if we're using post, if I want to actually be able to print this out, instead of saying get, I'm just going to say post all in caps. So basically this over here is going to match this down here. And post is basically just going to do exactly what get did, except it's going to do it without placing it up, up in the URL parameter. And there's also like a couple other small differences, like when you use post, um, you can actually get potentially more information from the user than when you use get. But the main difference is that when we use post, it's going to be more secure. So that information isn't going to show up inside of the URL. So over here, if I was just to like refresh my page, you'll see when I refresh my page, even though I have password equals to orange up here in the URL, it's not showing up down here anymore. Right. So that information, like when I put the information up here, it wasn't able to show up. But if I was to enter in a password into this text field because it's using this post method. So if I entered in um, my password and I click submit, now we're going to be able to grab that information securely. And you'll notice up here in the URL, there's no information, right? That information did not show up in the URL. It got passed between the client and the server in a more secure fashion. That's basically the difference between get and post get is just kind of like anything goes. Anyone can see the information. It's up there in the URL. And in a lot of cases, that's going to be useful. But in a lot of other cases, like in the case of a password or even like a username or, you know, a credit card number, I mean, any type of like secure information, um, you don't want it to show up inside that URL. You want it to be passed um, more securely back to PHP and we can use post in order to do that. So like I said, in certain circumstances, get's going to be appropriate in certain circumstances, post is going to be appropriate. But now that you kind of know the difference, you can kind of make that decision for yourself. And this is just a quick note um, about PHP in general. Most of the time developers are going to prefer to use post as opposed to get whenever they're, you know, getting information from a form just like this. So a lot of times you'll see people using post more so than using get. Um, get is going to be used more with like URL parameters. But here's the thing. It's really up to you. It's up to you, the developer, to make the decision as far as like what you want to be able to happen um, when that form gets submitted. But like I said, I think for the most part, people prefer to use post over get when they're getting information from a form. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about arrays in PHP. Now, an array is basically a container or it's a structure where we can store multiple pieces of information. So a lot of times in PHP, we're going to be dealing with all types of data. And one way that we can manage and maintain and keep track of that data is by using something called a variable. And throughout this course, we've been using variables. I've kind of, you know, showed you guys how they work. And a variable is great because it can store one single value. So it's a container where I can store a single data value. But a lot of times in PHP, we're not just going to want to be able to store one value. We're going to be able, want to be able to store large groups of values. So a lot of times an array is all that we need, right? A lot of times we only need to be able to store one value. But if you have like a large list of information or, you know, you need a container where you can store large amounts of information, that's where an array comes in. An array is actually very similar to a variable, but Unlike a variable, an array can store more than one piece of information inside of it. So an array could have 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000 or even a million values, a million pieces of information inside of it. So that's why arrays are really useful. And there's a lot of situations where you're going to want to be able to store and keep track of large amounts of information, and you can use arrays to do that. So I'm going to show you guys how we can create an array, how we can use it, and we'll sort of look at the basics. 
So down here in my PHP tags, I want to create an array. And we actually create an array very similar to the way that we create a normal variable. I'm just going to make a dollar sign and we're going to give this a name. So we want to give it a descriptive name and the name will basically tell us like what type of information is stored inside of this array. So I'm going to make a, an array that's going to store a bunch of like names. So we'll just call it friends. So maybe this could store like a list of a bunch of my friends. So I can say dollar sign friends is equal to, and now I want to type in array and I'm going to make an open and close parentheses. And then as always, we'll end it off with a semicolon. Now inside of these open and close parentheses, I can actually store multiple pieces of information inside of this array. So in our case, we're going to store, like I said, a list of friends names. So I could put like Kevin, Karen, Oscar, and then why don't we do one more Jim. So inside of this array, I've basically typed out all of these different values. And you'll notice that I separated each one of these values with a comma. So over here, I basically am just listing out all these different names. And these are all now elements inside of the friends array. So I would say that this over here is an element inside the friends array. This is an element in the friends array. This is an element. These are all elements inside of this one structure inside of this one container. So unlike a variable where I can only store one string in this array, I can store multiple strings side by side, just like that. And that's why these arrays are useful. So in addition to just storing a string inside of here, I mean, I could store any type of data that I want. So maybe in here, I also wanted to throw in like a number. Um, I could throw in like a Boolean value. Um, really, you can put any type of information that you want inside of these arrays. It's not going to matter. So now that we've actually created this array and we're storing all of this information, the question becomes, how do we access that information? Right. The information is no good if we can't access it. Right. So this container is actually storing all these pieces of information and I'm going to show you guys how we can access them. So over here, I'm actually just going to echo out something. So I'm just going to say echo and I'm going to show you guys how we can access individual elements inside of this array. Now, one thing I could do is I could just echo out friends just like this. And you'll see over here on my browser when I refresh the page, it's just printing out array. So it's basically just telling us like, hey, this is an array. There's a bunch of stuff in here. But if I wanted to access an individual element, for example, let's say I wanted to access the first element inside of the array, this Kevin value. After I type out the name of the variable, I can make an open and closed square bracket. And inside of this open and closed square bracket, I want to put in the index of the element that I want to access. So all of the elements inside of this array are assigned index positions. And so all I have to do in order to access the specific element is put its index inside of these square brackets. So if I want to access this first element here, I'm going to put a zero inside of here because the first element in the array is at index position zero. So now when I run my program over here, you'll see that we're printing out Kevin. So we're printing out that first name inside of the array. If I wanted to print out the second element, I could just put a one here. And this will print out the second one. So we should print out Karen. And if I wanted to print out Oscar over here, I could put a two in here and this will print out Oscar. So if you haven't caught on when we're giving index positions to these array elements, we start at zero. So we would say that the first element in the array, this Kevin is actually at index position zero. And then over here, we would say that the second element in the array, Karen is at index position one and so forth. So we're going to start zero, one, this is going to be two, this is going to be three. And this is very important. So this is how we're going to index these arrays. And if you're familiar with strings in PHP, this is actually the same way that we index strings. So we start with zero. So that's why I have to use these numbers down here. And that's really how we can access and work with a specific element in the array. Another thing I could do is I could modify one of the elements in the array. So for example, over here, let's say we wanted to modify this element right here where it says Karen. All I have to do is just say friends and I can make an open and close square bracket. And I want to put the index of the element that I want to modify. So Karen is at index position zero one. So I'm going to put a one over here and I could just give this a new value. So I could call this Dwight, for example. And now when I go down here and I print out friends one, 
the value will have updated. So now this should give us Dwight instead of giving us Karen. And it's also important to note that we can store different data types in these arrays alongside each other. So I could put like a 400 here, and this is a number, it's not a string, and you'll see that this is still gonna work. So I'm able to print out 400. All right, so this is really the basics of using arrays in PHP. It's essentially just a structure where we can store multiple pieces of information. Now, another thing that I can do is I could also add information onto this array. So you'll notice over here, we have four elements in this array and it's at index position zero, one, two, three. So there's no array element at index position four, but I could actually add an array element in if I wanted to. So I could come over here and I could say like friends four and I could add in another friend. So now I could name this friend like Angela. And down here I could print out friends four and this is going to give us Angela. So essentially what I did was I added an extra friend onto the end of that list and you can do stuff like that. I mean, I could also make this like a 10 and it would be the same thing. So I could add an element at index position 10 in this array and it's going to be no problem. It's going to be able to handle that just fine. Now I want to show you guys one more thing we can do, which is actually pretty useful with these arrays is you can figure out how many elements, are inside of the array. So I'm actually just gonna get rid of this and I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna print out count like this and then I'm gonna surround the array with open and closed parentheses. So I'm saying count and then inside of these parentheses friends and this is gonna tell me how many elements are inside of this array. So you'll see over here we're getting four. And if I wanted, like I said, I could add another element. So I could say like friends four is equal to Mike, and now we should get five here instead of four because I added another element. And that's kind of the basics of working with arrays. Arrays are extremely useful and there's gonna be tons of situations where you wanna use them. So, so you wanna make sure that you have a pretty solid understanding of these going forward. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how we can get input from checkboxes in PHP. This is gonna be a pretty cool tutorial because not only are we gonna learn how to get input from text boxes, but we're also gonna see how we can use arrays out in the real world. So this is gonna be an example where we're actually get information from the user. We'll store that information inside of an array and then we can kind of work with it. So this is gonna be pretty cool. Now over here in my program, I have just sort of a basic program set up already. Um, down here I have a form and you can see the action is site.php. That's this file that I'm currently working on. And then over here, the method is post. And then down here we have our submit button. So this is a pretty standard form. And then down here in our PHP, I haven't actually written anything yet. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you guys how we can work with checkboxes. And a checkbox is basically just, you know, like a little box where you can check. And what we'll actually do is we'll have like a list of checkboxes. So we'll have like four or five. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow the user to select their favorite fruits. So I'm gonna have like a little list of a bunch of fruits and the user will be able to check which fruits they like and they'll be able to submit that information to us. So it's gonna be pretty cool. And it'll just kind of demonstrate how we can use checkboxes and how we can also use arrays. So over here, um, right on top of this submit, I'm gonna make another input. I'm just gonna say input, the type is gonna be equal to checkbox. So this is basically gonna tell HTML that we wanna create a checkbox. And then over here, I want to give this a name. So I'm gonna say name is equal to, I'm just gonna call this fruits and I'm gonna make an open and closed square bracket. Now, whenever we're trying to get input from like multiple checkboxes, we always wanna put these square brackets here. And basically that's gonna signify that we're gonna store all of these fruits inside of an array. And once they're in the array, it'll be a lot easier for us to work with them and do different things with them. And finally, I wanna put one more attribute down here, which is gonna be value. And value is essentially gonna be the value that this checkbox is gonna have associated to it. So we're gonna have this checkbox be a checkbox for apples. So that's gonna be our first fruit. So if the user checks this checkbox, that means that they like apples because that's the value over here. And then I'm just gonna put a break over here. And actually I'm gonna do one more thing. So I'm gonna come over here to the left of this input and I'm just gonna type out what it is for. So I'll just say apples and 
Now what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna do this for uh, a bunch of different fruits. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this line of code and I'm basically just gonna paste it down here a few times. So why don't we do like three different fruits? So we'll do apples, let's do oranges. So I'm just gonna change this to oranges over here. And then over here on the value, I'm also gonna change this to oranges. And then down here, why don't we do pears? So this one's gonna be pears. And then once again, over here, I'm gonna change this to pears. So we have a checkbox for three different fruits. And you know, making the checkbox is pretty simple. Again, we just have to specify the type. We have to give it a name. And remember, if we want all of these checkboxes to sort of be stored inside of the same array, in other words, if we want the values that the user checks to be stored in the same container, in the same array, we have to name it just like this. And then finally, we give each of these a value. So if I was to refresh my page, you'll see over here that we get um, all these different checkboxes. And what's cool about checkboxes is I could check multiple boxes. So, you know, I can basically just check and uncheck as many as I want. Here's the question though. What I wanna do is I wanna be able to get the values that the user checks. So if the user checks apples and oranges, when they click submit, I wanna be able to get that information, right? If they select all three, I wanna be able to get that information. And because the user is able to select multiple pieces of information here, we're storing it inside of an array. And remember, an array is just a container that can hold multiple pieces of information. And that's basically what I was saying down here in this name. I'm saying, I wanna store all of these values. In other words, I wanna store the values that the user checks inside of this fruits array. So inside of our PHP now, we can actually get that information. So what I can do is I can come down here and I'm gonna create a variable called fruits and I'm gonna set this equal to dollar sign underscore post in all capitals. And remember, I use post up here, so I wanna use post down here. And I'm gonna make an open and close square bracket and inside of here, we're just gonna type out fruits. So I'm basically typing out the name that I specified up here, although we're gonna leave off the square brackets. We don't need that. So down here, I now am storing all the fruits that the user checked and submitted inside of this variable. And actually, this is an array. So this is an array that's holding all the fruits that the user checked from the checkbox. So I could come down here and why don't we just like echo this out just so we can kind of see what's going on. So I'll echo out fruits zero. So this is basically gonna tell us what the first fruit that was checked is. So over here back on our web browser, I'm just going to refresh the page and now I'm gonna go ahead and do this. So I'm gonna check apples and oranges. So I'm checking two of these different boxes. When I click submit, we should be printing out apples because that was the first checkbox that I checked. So now when I click submit, you see we're getting apples down here. If I was to come over here and print out fruits one, so this is gonna be the second fruit in the list. Now, if I do the same thing, so if I do apples and oranges, we should be printing out oranges because that was the second element that was stored inside of that array. If I only checked one of these though, since I'm trying to print out the second element in the array, it should be blank. So now you can see it's blank. And if I did like oranges and pears, now we'll be printing out pears. So that's basically how these checkboxes work, right? I can set up all these different checkboxes and because I gave them all the same name over here, they're all gonna be stored inside of the same array. So when I click that submit button, all that information is getting passed back to PHP on the server, and it's basically storing that information inside of an array, and then I can work with that information and do different things with it. So this is a pretty useful thing to do on your websites, and as you can see, it's very simple, right? And we can use that array structure in order to store all of that information. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how to use associative arrays in PHP. An associative array is a special type of array where not only we can store data values, but we can actually store what are called key value pairs. So unlike a normal array where I could just store like numbers or text or a combination of both, in an associative array, I could store a series of key value pairs which would allow me to access that information differently. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys how these work. The easiest way to wrap your mind around it is just to see an example. So 
let's create an example and then we're actually going to create a little um, web application where um, we can use these associative arrays. So down here, I'm going to show you guys how we can use these. Let's say that I was writing a website for a school. And for this website, I wanted to be able to keep track of the different students in my class and the grades that they got on a particular test. Well, this is actually a scenario where we could use something called an associative array. So in other words, inside of this array, I'm going to be storing two pieces of information. I'm going to be storing the student's name and I'm going to be storing the grade that they got on the test. And those two data values are sort of like linked together. And in an associative array, we could actually represent data like that. So I'm going to create this just like I'd create a normal array. I'm going to make a dollar sign. And why don't we just call this like grades and I'm going to set this equal to array with an open and close parentheses. So, so far, this is exactly like a normal array. The difference is though, now when I put elements inside of this array, instead of just storing single pieces of information, I'm going to store key value pairs. So the first thing I want to do is store the student's name. So let's say the student's name is Jim. And then I want to say equal sign greater than sign. And I'm going to store the grade that Jim got on the test. So let's say that Jim got an A plus on the test. Let's say Jim's really smart. So unlike a normal element in an array, I'm storing a key, which is the student's name, and then I'm storing a value. In other words, I'm mapping a value to a specific student's name. Over here, I can do the same thing for another student. So let's say we have another student, Pam, and let's say that Pam got a B minus on the test. All right, so now I'm storing the student and I'm also storing the grade that they got on the test. Why don't we do one more? Let's make another student. And you'll notice I'm separating these different students with this comma, just like I would normal array elements. So over here, we're just going to say Oscar. And let's say that Oscar got a C plus on the test. All right, so we have our three students, Jim, who got an A plus, Pam, who got a B minus, and Oscar, who got a C plus. So you'll notice I'm storing a key and then I'm mapping it to a particular value. I'm storing the student's name and I'm mapping that name to a particular grade. And what's cool about these associative arrays is when I want to access one of these elements, I could just come down here and I could say grades and I'm going to make an open and close square bracket. And in here I can just type in the name of the student. So I could say grades Jim. And this is actually going to tell me what grade Jim got on the test. So when I refresh the page over here and actually, whoops, I need to echo this out. So I'm going to say echo. This is going to tell me what grade Jim got. So we can see over here, Jim got an A plus. I could do the same thing for Oscar. So I'm just going to see what Oscar got. Looks like Oscar got a C plus. So unlike a normal array where we access elements using their index position, in an associative array, we access elements using what's called a key. And the key is basically this value over here. So we would say that Jim is a key, Pam is a key, and Oscar is a key. And then over here, we have the values. So we have a key, and it's mapped to a particular value. And I wanna, when I want to access that value inside the associative array, I just pass in the key. And one thing you do want to keep in mind is that you want all of the keys inside of your associative array to be unique. So if I came over here and I made this student also named Jim, well, then when I tried to access Jim, like it's unclear which one we're referring to. So you always want to make sure that these are unique, right? So I have different names for all of these keys. The values can be the same, however. So I could um, come over here and have Pam also get an A plus just like Jim, and that's going to be no problem. But you always want to make sure that those keys are unique. And just like with a normal array, I could also come over here and modify this. So I could say like grades Jim, and I could give this a value. So I can say grades Jim is equal to F. So let's say now Jim fails the test. And over here, when we print this out, Jim's is going to have a new value of F. So you can essentially do everything you would do with a normal array. You could also um, get how many elements are inside of it. So I could say count and over here, this will tell us how many key mappings we have. So we have three. And like I said, it's just like a, you know, any normal array that we would have in our program. I want to show you guys how we could use this to build um, a little website. So what I'm going to do is I actually have a form set up over here and I'm just going to uncomment this and you'll see it's a simple form. It's just action is site.php. That's this file. Um, we're using the post method. 
and then down here we have an input button. What I want to do is I want to write a website where the user can enter in a name and then we will basically print out what grade that user got on the test. So I could come over here and I'm just going to make another um, input and I'm just going to say type is equal to text. This is just going to be a text box and I'm going to give this a name. So why don't we call this student? And essentially inside of this text box, we're going to be printing, we're going to be typing in the student's name whose grade we want to figure out. And so what I can do is when the user submits, when they click this submit button, I could actually come down here and access that information. So what I could do is I could say echo and I'm going to echo out grades and then I want to get the value that they passed in. So I'm going to make an open and close square bracket and inside of here, I'm going to put dollar sign underscore post open and close square bracket. And in here, we're just going to put student. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the value that the user entered inside of that text box and I'm accessing that element inside of the associative array. So let's go over here and refresh our page and you'll see we have our text box. So if I typed in like Jim, for example, when I click submit, this should tell me what grade Jim got on the test. So you'll see we get back a plus. I could do the same for Pam and it looks like Pam also got an A plus and then we could do it for Oscar and Oscar got that C plus. So this is basically a way that we could wire up like getting user input with an associative array. And this is actually really useful. So you can see how storing the information like this in an associative array where we have key value pairs makes it really, really easy for us to access that information in the future. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how to use functions in PHP. Now, a function is basically just a special container where we can put a bunch of code that's designed to perform a specific task. So a lot of times when you're writing your PHP code, you're going to have certain code which is going to be naturally grouped together. So you're going to have certain code which is naturally just like performing, you know, some common task. And a lot of times in PHP, what we can do is we can take code like that and we can put it inside of its own special container called a function. And the cool thing about functions is it allows you to organize all the code on your website, but a function is also going to be able to be reusable. So I could basically take some code that performs a specific task, put it inside of a function, and then I can use it in multiple places throughout my program. And that is extremely powerful. So in this tutorial, I'm just going to give you guys a basic introduction into functions. We're going to create a function and we're going to kind of talk about how they work. So down here in my PHP tags, I'm going to go ahead and create a function. And like I said, a function is basically just a container where we can put a bunch of code that's designed to perform a specific task. So in this tutorial, I'm actually going to create a function which is going to say hi to the user. So the whole purpose of this function is going to be to say hi to the user. And I'll show you guys how we can use this um, and how we can leverage its power. So when we create a function, the first thing we want to do is just type out the word function. And this is going to tell PHP that we want to create a function. The next thing we want to do is give this function a name. So you basically want to give it a name, which is going to describe what it's doing. So in our case, we're building a function, which is going to say hi to the user. So I'm just going to call this say hi, just like that. And then I'm going to make an open and close parentheses and I'm going to make an open and close curly bracket. And what I want to do is I want to go inside of this open and close curly brackets. So you'll see in here, I'm typing inside of these curly brackets and any code that you put in between those curly brackets is going to be considered part of the function. So whatever code I want to put in there, that's technically, technically going to be part of this function. So I'm going to make a very simple function. I'm just going to type out one line of code and it's just going to say, hello user. Now I have one line of code here in my function, but you could have as many lines of code as you want. Functions can hold, you know, dozens or hundreds of lines of code. Doesn't really matter. And so now that I created this function, I'm going to go ahead and run my little program here. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh my browser, but you'll see when I refresh my browser, nothing happens. So nothing is actually getting printed out. And here's the problem. Anytime we put code inside of a function like this, that code is only going to execute when we do something called calling the function. So for this code to execute, I have to call this function. So I'm going to come down here below the function and I'm going to call it. 
And the way that we can call a function is just by typing out its name. So I can just type out say hi, and then I'm gonna type an open and close parentheses. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm telling PHP that I wanna execute all of the code inside of this function. So when PHP is looking through this file and it comes down here and it sees say hi, it's gonna know that it has to jump up over here and execute this code. So now when I refresh my browser, you'll see that it we're printing out hello user. So the code inside of that function, it's actually getting executed. And this is obviously a very simple function. And like I said, the whole point is that whenever you have code that's you know performing a specific task, you can put it inside of a function just like that. But we can take this a step further. So another cool thing we can do with these functions is we can actually give them information. So I can give this function information, which are called parameters, and then the function can use those parameters or the information that gets passed in in order to do different things. So what I could do is I could come over here and let's say that instead of just saying hi to the user, we wanted this to say hi to someone specific, right? So what I can do is I can essentially create a variable up here in these parentheses. I'm just gonna say dollar sign and I'm just gonna call it name. And now I can come down here and instead of printing out user, I'm just gonna print out name. And so essentially what I did up here is I specified that this function, this say hi function, is going to take in a parameter. So it's gonna take one value in. That means whenever I call this function, for example, if I call it down here, I have to pass it a name. I have to pass it a value. So I could go ahead and I could pass it like a name, like my name. So I can pass it the value Mike. And now this value is gonna get stored inside of this name variable and it's gonna print out hello Mike down here. So now when I run my program, you'll see it's printing out hello Mike instead of printing out hello user. And I could change that depending on what I put in here. So if I put like Tom in here, now it's gonna print out hello Tom. So this function is using the piece of information that I gave it in order to perform its task a little bit differently. And that's sort of like what functions are. Um, and another cool thing we can do with functions is we can actually reuse this code. So I can write this code up here one time and I can execute it as many times as I want inside of my program. So for example, I could come down here and I could just copy this and I could paste it a few times and I could say hi to Tom, I could say hi to Dave, we could also say hi to Oscar. And so I'm basically saying that I wanna call this function three times, I'm passing it three different pieces of information and actually over here, I'm just gonna put a break tag so we can kind of see this a little bit easier. And so now it's gonna print out, hello Tom, hello Dave, and hello Oscar. So when I refresh this, you'll see it's printing out all of that. So I wrote this code one time, I wrote the code to say hi to the user one single time, and I was able to use it three times throughout my program. And that's kind of one of the core concepts with functions, is you can write them once and you can use them a bunch of different times. So we can actually reuse this code throughout our program. And in addition to just passing in one parameter, I could pass in as many as I want. So I can put a comma over here and let's say I want the user to pass in an age as well. And now I could say, hello, name, you are age, right? So down here, I can pass in two parameters now. So I could say Tom is 40, let's say Dave is 13 and Oscar is 80. And now our program is going to be able to respond to that. So you'll see it's saying, hello, Tom, you're 40, Dave's 13, Oscar's 80. So we can pass in two or three. I mean, you can pass in as many parameters basically as you want. And then whenever you call the function, you need to pass them in just like that. So that's why functions are useful. Functions are actually extremely useful. And there's a lot of situations in PHP where we're going to want to use them. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about return statements in PHP functions. So one of the cool things about functions in PHP is that they allow us to group similar code together that performs specific tasks. So a function is essentially just a container where we can put um, different lines of code and then we can reuse that code throughout our programs. And if you've been following along with the course, we kind of looked at the basics of functions in the last tutorial. And one of the things we talked about was how we can give functions information in the form of parameters. So I could actually like give a function a couple of different pieces of information, and then the function can use that information to perform its task. 
In this tutorial, I wanna to talk to you guys about another cool thing with functions, which is in addition to us giving functions information in the form of parameters, a function can also give us information back. So if I call a function in my program, not only can I give that function information, but that function can also give information back to me. So it could tell me like, you know, how the function went. It could give me a particular piece of information back. It could pass me back like an array or a variable. It could do all sorts of stuff. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can use um, returns in PHP functions. So what I wanna do in this tutorial is I'm actually gonna create a function which is gonna cube a number. And whenever we cube a number, you're basically taking it to the power of three. So if I was to say like two raised to the power of three, that's the same as two times two times two, right? This is me cubing a number. And what we wanna do is we're gonna write a function which uh, will cube a number. So I could pass a number into it and it'll go ahead and cube that number for me. It's gonna be a pretty simple function, but this will kind of illustrate the point that I'm trying to get across in this tutorial. So Whenever we create a function, we always just wanna say function like that. And then we're gonna give this a name. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and name this function cube because that's what it's doing. It's gonna cube a number. I'm gonna make an open and close parentheses and an open and close curly bracket. Inside of these open and close parentheses, what I wanna do is I wanna specify that this function is gonna take one parameter. So we're gonna allow the user to pass one value into this function and I'm just gonna call it num. So this is gonna be the number that we wanna cube. And the goal of this function is gonna to be to take this number, cube it, and then return that value back to the user. So not only are we gonna cube the number, but we're also gonna return the result of cubing that number back to the user. So this should be pretty cool. All right, so now that we have our function set up, I'm gonna go ahead and write the code. So this is actually gonna be a pretty simple function. All we really have to do is just cube num. So I can basically just say, num times num times num, right? I mean, essentially by doing this, I'm cubing the number. But here's the problem is, I don't just wanna cube the number, I wanna return the result of cubing the number back to the caller. So whoever calls this function, I wanna give this value back to them. And in order to do that, we can use a special word in PHP, which is called return. So I can come over here and just type return, and basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna return the value that's over here back to the caller. In other words, back to whoever called this function. So if I was to come down here, I could actually call this function and it's gonna give me a value back. So I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate that. I'm actually gonna create a variable and I'm just gonna call it cube result. And I'm gonna set it equal to cube so I'm calling this cube function and I'm gonna pass it a number, so why don't we pass it in a four? So we're gonna cube four. And I'm storing the value that gets returned from this cube function inside of this variable. So essentially what happens is when I call this cube function, it goes off, it executes all this code, and when it sees this return keyword, it's basically gonna pass this value back down here. So when I say cube result is equal to cube four, the value of cubing four is gonna get stored inside of this variable. So let me show you guys that. I'm just gonna echo this out. So I'll echo out cube result. And now when I run my program, you guys will see I should get 64 back because 64 is four cubed, right? Four times four is 16. 16 times four is 64. So essentially what happened was by using this return keyword, I was actually able to get this value. If I was, If I got rid of this return keyword, so if I just, um, you know, put this line over here, you'll see that we don't get anything. And that's because nothing was returned from this function. But when I put the return keyword here, then everything works and we're golden. So actually what I could do is I could just cut off the middleman and I could just print this out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put this in here. And now we're just printing out cube four, so it's gonna do the same thing. Because this is getting a value back when we call that function. So essentially what happens is whenever we put this return keyword in there, it's always going to be the last line of the function. So whenever PHP is going through and executing this function, whenever it sees this return keyword, it's going to break out of the function. So let me show you guys. If I was to come down here and say like echo hello, 
you'd think when I call this cube function that it'll go over here, it'll return this value, and then it'll print out hello, right? But when I run this program, you'll see that we're not printing out hello. This line of code never gets executed. PHP never sees it, never touches it. That's because whenever I put this return keyword in here, this is gonna break us out of the function and we're gonna go back down here. So whenever I say return, that's basically me saying, hey, I'm done with this function. Um, if I was to take this and put this up here above the return keyword, now we're gonna be fine, right? Because over here, it's still printing out hello. That's because I printed this out before that return keyword. So really, you can return any type of value that you want. You could return numbers like I did over here. You could return a string. You could return an array. You could return an associative array. Basically, you can return any you know, type of information that you want to return um, using that return statement. You could also just return nothing. So I could just come over here and just say return. And this will still break me out of the function but it won't return a value. And sometimes people will do that if they just wanna kind of like break out of a function. But I'd say for the most part, you're gonna be returning information back to the caller. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how to use if statements in PHP. Now an if statement is basically a special programming structure which allows our programs to make decisions. So by using if statements, I can actually allow my program to respond to the different pieces of information in the program and do different things in different situations. So if statements are extremely useful and basically they just make our programs a lot smarter. So I'm gonna give you guys a total introduction into if statements. We'll look at a basic example and then later on in the course, we're gonna use if statements to do a bunch of different stuff. So over here, I have this little text file open and one of the cool things about if statements is that we actually encounter tons of if statements um, in our everyday lives. And I've kind of like highlighted a couple that you might see every day. Um, over here it says, I wake up, if I'm hungry, I eat breakfast. And this is actually an if statement, believe it or not. This is the type of thing that we're gonna be able to code into our programs. So I, it says, I wake up, if I'm hungry, I eat breakfast. Now, basically this is saying that if a certain condition is true, then I'm gonna do something. So it says, if I'm hungry, and if I'm hungry is either true or false, right? You're either hungry or you're not. So if I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat breakfast, right? So if this condition up here is true, then I'm gonna perform this action down here. I'm gonna eat breakfast. But if this condition up here is false, in other words, if I'm not hungry, then I'm just gonna move on, right? So I'm not gonna eat breakfast. I'm just gonna kind of move on with my life. Here's another one down here. It says, I look at my phone. If it's about to die, I charge it. And this is another if statement. So it says, if my phone's about to die, and this is a condition. So this is either true or it's false. If it's true, in other words, if my phone is about to die, then I charge it. If it's false, then I just move on. And then finally, there's one more down here. It says, I leave my house if it's cloudy. So here's a condition. The condition is saying, if it's cloudy. If that's true, if the condition is true, then I'm gonna bring an umbrella. Otherwise though, I'm gonna bring sunglasses. And you can see this if statement is a little bit different than the ones that I showed you up there because we have this little otherwise, right? So if it's not cloudy, in other words, if this condition up here is false, then we're gonna bring sunglasses. So this is essentially as complicated as if statements are. It's just, we're checking a condition, we're checking to see if something is true, like whether or not it's cloudy or whether or not your phone's about to die or whether or not you're hungry. We're checking a condition. If that condition's true, we're gonna do something. And in some cases, if that condition's false, like down here, we could do something else. So I wanna show you guys how we can sort of use this type of if logic in our programs to help our programs to make decisions. All right, so I'm gonna go back over here to my site.php file, and this is the file that I'm you know, sort of writing all my PHP in. And then down here in the PHP blocks, I'm actually gonna create an if statement. So I'm gonna create a very simple if statement just to illustrate how we can do this in PHP. All right, so down here, the first thing I'm gonna do before I create my if statement is I'm actually gonna create a variable. So I'm just gonna say, um, dollar sign, and I'm gonna call this variable is mail. 
And this variable is gonna keep track of whether or not someone is a male. So I'm gonna say is male, and why don't we just set this equal to true? So this is a Boolean variable. It's storing a Boolean value, which means it's storing a true or a false value. Now that I have this Boolean variable, what I wanna do is I wanna write a program that will respond to this. So let's say that inside of my program, if the person's male, in other words, if this variable is true, I wanna do something. In order to do that, I can use an if statement. So I could come down here and I could just say if, and then I'm gonna make an open and close parentheses and an open and close curly bracket. And this is sort of like the general template, the general uh, skeleton of an if statement. So over here in these parentheses, I want to write a condition, right? So if you remember when we were looking at those if statements, like those real life if statements, I had a bunch of different conditions, like if my phone is charged or if I'm hungry or if it's cloudy outside, right? I had all those conditions that were either true or false. And that's exactly what I wanna put inside of these parentheses. Essentially, I wanna put a condition that's gonna be either true or false. In our case, we have this variable up here, is male, and this is a Boolean variable. So it's either true or false. So we can actually use this variable as the condition for our if statement. So I could say if, and then down here, I'm just gonna say is male. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm checking to see if the person is male. And if the person's male, then inside of these curly brackets, I can specify what we wanna do. So I could just basically echo out like, you are male. And so now this if statement is actually gonna be able to respond to this variable. So if this variable is male is true, then we're gonna print out you are male. But if it's not true, then we're just gonna move on and we're not gonna print out you are male. So let's go ahead and run this program. And you'll see over here, it says you are male. The value of is male was true, but if I change this to false, now when I run my program, we're not gonna be printing out you are male. We're just gonna print out nothing. And that's because over here, this line of code, in other words, the line of code that's in between these curly brackets is only gonna get executed when this condition up here inside the parentheses is false. And so down here, I can specify whatever code I want. I mean, I could have you know 20 or 30 lines of code if I wanted to. I just have one here for simplicity's sake. But let's say that we wanna make this a little bit more complex, right? So over here, when the person's male, we're able to tell them that, right? So if this variable over here is true, then we'll execute this line of code. But what about when the variable is false? What about when the condition up here is false? Let's say that instead of just moving on and printing out nothing, we wanted to tell them that they weren't male. So we wanted to print out like, hey, you're not male. Well, what I could do is I could come down here and I can use another keyword in PHP, which is called else. So I can say else, just like that. I can make an open and close curly bracket. And now down here inside of this open and close curly bracket, I can specify code that's gonna get executed when this condition up here is false. So I could actually come down here and I could print out echo and I could say, you are not male. And so now if this variable up here is set to false, in other words, if the condition inside of these quotation marks is false, then we're gonna execute this line of code. So let me show you guys that. Since is male is false, now when I refresh my page, our program will respond to that. So my program is saying, you are not male. In other words, my program is now smart enough to be able to respond to this variable. So if that variable is true, my program can respond to it. If it's false, my program can also respond to it. That's because I put this variable here in this if condition. And so that's really the basics of what an if statement is. It allows us to respond to different situations. In the situation that the person's male, we're able to respond to that and tell them that they're male. In the situation that they're not male, we can also respond to that. And really, at a core level, that's what an if statement is. It's just a way for us to respond to the different information, to the different data that is inside of our programs. But really, this is just scratching the surface. So I wanna show you guys how we can make this even more powerful. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna create another variable up here. So in addition to a variable called isMale, I'm also gonna create a variable called isTall. 
and I'm gonna go ahead and set this equal to true. So this is also gonna be a Boolean variable. And why don't I also set this guy equal to true up here? So now, not only am I dealing with one piece of information, but I'm dealing with two pieces of information. So let's see if we can make our if statement powerful enough to be able to handle both of these pieces of data. Well, let's say that when the person was male and when the person was tall, we wanted to do something. So if the person was like a tall male, then we wanted to be able to tell them that. I could actually come down here and I could modify this condition. So instead of just checking to see if they're male, I'm also going to check to see if they're tall. So over here inside of this condition, I can say if is male, and then I can use what's called the and operator. And it's just two ampersands just like this. And basically what this is going to allow me to do is check another condition. So in addition to just checking the is male condition, I could also come over here and I could check to see if they're also tall. And basically what this is saying is if the person is male and they're tall, then we're going to execute this code down here. But if they're not male or they're not tall, then we're going to go ahead and execute this down here. So in order for this condition to be true, they have to be both male and they also have to be tall. So down here I could say like you are a tall male because if this code gets executed, that means they're both male and tall. So now when I run my program, you guys will see because both of these are true, now it's going to tell me that. So it's going to say you are a tall male. But here's the problem. If I came over here and set one of these guys equal to false. So if I set is tall equal to false now, because both of these guys aren't true. In other words, because one of them is false. Now this whole thing is going to be false and we're going to come down here and print this out. And so it's going to say you are not male. So obviously we could change the text for that, but you guys will see what happens. So I'm going to refresh the page and now it says you are not male. So basically it executed the code that was down here in this else block because one of these guys was false. And that would do the same thing if both of them were false. So when I use that and operator, both of these guys have to be true. And I also want to show you guys another operator, which is called the or operator. And the or operator is just two vertical bars just like that. And it's actually very similar to the and operator. It allows us to check two conditions. But the difference is with the or operator, only one of these conditions needs to be true in order for the whole thing to be true. So unlike and where is male had to be true and is tall had to be true. Now only one of these guys has to be true and we'll still execute this code. So you'll see here because is male is true, we're still going to be able to say that you're a tall male and you can see it works out just like that. So that's sort of the difference between and and or essentially it just allows us to check multiple conditions. Um, I'm actually going to turn this back to and and Let's sort of talk about this if statement some more. So you'll notice here I'm checking to see if they're male and I'm also checking to see if they're tall, right? So in a situation like that, we can tell them that. So we can tell them, hey, you're a tall male. But what about the situation where they're male, but they're not tall? Let's say that in that situation, in the situation where um, this condition is true and this condition is false, I wanted to do something else. So maybe I wanted to print out like, hey, you are a short male because they're not tall. Well, I can actually account for that and I can use something called an else if and an else if is basically a way for me to check another condition if this condition up here is false. So what I could do is I could come down here and I'm just going to type out else if just like that and then I'm going to make an open and close parentheses and I'm going to make an open and close curly bracket and then I'm just going to type enter. So you can see how I basically just embedded this little else if right in here and it goes before this else. So here's this if statement and we have this opening curly bracket, the closing curly bracket. We have the else if with the opening curly bracket and the closing curly bracket. And then here's that else finally. So basically what this means is if this condition up here is false, then instead of just jumping down here to the else, we're going to come at down here to the else if and we're going to check another condition. So over here in these parentheses, I can actually specify another condition. And let's say that we want to check to see if the person is male and they're not tall. So instead of checking to see if they're tall, I want to check to see if they're not tall. So I can actually come down here and say dollar sign is male. 
So I wanna check to see if they're male, and I wanna check to see now if they're not tall. And in order to check to see if they're not tall, I can use something called the negation operator. And the negation operator will basically take the opposite of the condition that we specify. So I could say exclamation point just like that, and then I can type out is tall. And because I included this exclamation point here, it's basically gonna negate whatever this value is. So if that value is true, then this exclamation point is gonna make it false. And if that value is false, the exclamation point is gonna make it true. And so essentially we can use this exclamation point to check to see if they're not tall. And so I would read this, else if is male and not is tall. So is not tall. And so down here, what we could do is we could actually print out you are a short male. So I could say you are a short male. And so now if I set is tall equal to false, like I did up here, this if statement is actually gonna be able to catch that. So now when I refresh my page, it's telling me you are a short male. So it checked this condition up here, and this condition was false because one of these guys was false. Then since this was false, it came down here and checked this else if, and it checked to see if they were male and if they were not tall. And that ended up being true because is male is true and is tall is false. And so we printed out you are a short male. So I could do the same exact thing for the other scenario where they're tall, but they're not male. So I could actually come down here and I'm gonna make another else if. So I'm just gonna say else if, open and close parentheses, open and close curly bracket, and I'm gonna click enter. So now I have another else if here and I'm gonna check another condition. Now I wanna to check to see if they're not male and they're tall. So I can say exclamation point dollar sign is male and dollar sign is tall. So this is gonna be true when they're not male, in other words, when is male is equal to false, and when is tall is equal to true. So I can, again, just kind of copy this guy, and I'm gonna say you are not male, but are tall. So I'm basically saying that they're not a male, but nonetheless, they are tall. So basically now we're covering every possible situation. We're covering the situation where they're male and tall, we're covering the situation where they're male and short, we're covering the situation where they're tall but not male, and then finally down here, this else is gonna cover the condition where they're not male and not tall. So I could say you are not male and not tall. And basically this else is gonna get executed when none of these conditions up here is true. So when none of that is true, we'll come down here and we'll execute this else. So we actually have an if statement that will cover every possible scenario for these two variables. So if they're both equal to true, it's gonna tell us you're a tall male. If is male is equal to false, our program is going to be able to respond to that. So our program will tell us you're not male, but are tall. If I set is tall equal to false and I set is male equal to true, our program once again is going to be smart enough to respond to that. So it's going to say you are a short male. And finally, if I set both of these guys equal to false, then our program once again will respond to that and it's going to say you are not male and not tall. So using these if statements, my program was able to respond to the different pieces of information that it was given. And in this tutorial, I covered a lot of the basics. I covered how to use if, how to use else if, how to use else. Um, we talked about this and operator. We talked about the or operator. We talked about the negation operator. But there's actually a lot more to talk about. And in the next tutorial, I'm going to talk about another subject with if statements which is called comparisons. So inside of these if statements, instead of just using like Boolean variables like I did over here, I could actually compare different pieces of information. So I could compare like numbers or strings um, or you know different, different types of information and I could use those comparisons as the basis for my if statement conditions. So stick around for that and we're gonna talk about how we can use comparisons with if statements. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how we can use comparisons in if statements in PHP. 
So a lot of times when we use if statements, one of the things we can do is we can actually compare different information. So for example, if I had two pieces of information in my program, I could compare those pieces of information and depending on the result of that comparison, I could do different things. And one of the coolest things about if statements is that it allows us to compare and you know, sort of like work with all the different pieces of information in our programs. So down here in my PHP tags, I'm actually going to create a function. And what I want to do is I want to create a function which I can pass two numbers and it'll tell me the maximum of those two numbers. So there's actually a function like this already in PHP. It's called the max function. So I could say echo max and then over here I could pass it like a three and a six. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to tell me which number is bigger. So when I refresh my browser over here, it gives me a six, right? So no matter what numbers I pass in here, this function will always be able to tell me which one is bigger. And I want to show you guys how we could actually make a function just like this um, on our own in PHP. So instead of using this, I could actually write my own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function. So I'm just going to say function and I'm just going to call this get max. So I'm not going to use the name max just because that other function is already using it. So I don't want to like confuse myself. Um, so I'm just going to say function get max. And then over here, I'm going to make an open and close parentheses and an open and close curly bracket. So that max function that we looked at before took two parameters. So two numbers. So I'm just going to say num1 and num2. So we're going to take in two parameters. What we want to do is we want to figure out which of these numbers is bigger. So I want to figure out if num1 is bigger or if num2 is bigger. Then I want to return that back to the caller. So I want to actually return that piece of information back. So here's the question. How can we figure out which of these two numbers is bigger. In other words, how can we figure out which one we should return back to the caller? Well, we could actually use an if statement. So I'm going to go ahead and set up an if statement. I'm just going to say if I make an open and close parentheses, open and close curly bracket. And inside of this parentheses, we need to specify a condition. Now, if you've been following along with the course, you'll know that in the last tutorial, I gave like a full overview of uh, if statements and we were using Boolean variables inside of these parentheses. And so essentially what we need to put inside of here is a true or a false value. We need to put a condition. But one of the things I can do with these if statements is I can actually compare different values. So I could say like if num1 is greater than num2. And you might not think that this is a true or false value, but it actually is. I'm comparing these two values together. And num1 is either greater than num2 or it's not, right? It's either true or it's false. Like this comparison, num1 greater than num2, is either true or it's false. Num1's either bigger or it's not. And so this actually gets resolved down to a true or a false value. And therefore, we can put it inside of these parentheses and use it as a condition. So I can say if num1 is greater than num2, then down here I can do something. So I'm actually just going to return num1. And remember, whenever I use this return keyword, it breaks me out of the function. So whenever I use this return keyword, then we're basically done with the function. We kind of leave the function, we go back to um, wherever the function was called from. And so I'm basically just going to return num1 back and that'll be the end of this function. Otherwise, though, I'm going to say else. So if this condition isn't true, in other words, if num1 isn't greater than num2, then I'm just going to return num2. So believe it or not, this is actually all the code that we need for this get max function, right? We're getting these two numbers. I'm saying if num1 is greater than num2, then I'll return num1, right? Because if this condition's true, I know for a fact num1 is the biggest. Otherwise, though, we're going to return num2. All right, so down here below this function, I'm just going to call it. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and echo out the answer. Um, so I'm just going to say get max, and I'm going to pass in two numbers. So let's pass in a 3 and a 90. So this one's pretty obvious. We should get 90 back, assuming we wrote that if statement correctly. And I'm going to refresh the page. And actually, it looks like I forgot to put a semicolon over here. That's my bad. 
Um, all right, so now when I refresh the page, we shouldn't get an error and you'll see we're getting 90. So it looks like this function worked. Now I'm gonna say, let's try num1 as the biggest. So let's say the first number we pass in is gonna be the biggest. We'll see if we can handle it and we can. So we get 300. So looks like our get max function is working and that's all thanks to this comparison, right? I compared these two different numbers and I was able to return the correct answer. But let's say now that instead of just passing in two numbers, we wanted to make this function a little bit more complex. So let's say we wanted to be able to figure out the maximum of three numbers. So in addition to passing in num1 and num2, I also wanted to pass in a num3. Well, this actually makes our function a little bit more complex, but nevertheless, we should still be able to figure it out. So why don't we start over and we'll start fresh with a new if statement. So I'm gonna create a new if statement and now we need to figure out what types of comparisons we need to make in order to figure out which of these numbers is the biggest. Well, what we can do is we can basically check to see if num1 is the biggest first. So I could check to see if num1 is greater than or equal to num2 and, so I'm gonna use this and operator, num1 is greater than or equal to num3. So unlike before when I was just checking to see if it was greater than, now I'm checking to see if it's greater than or equal to. And honestly, we could use either of them here, but I'm gonna use greater than or equal to. So if this is true, in other words, if this whole condition up here is true, that means that num1 is the biggest. So I can just return num1, just like that. So basically I'm checking to see if num1 is greater than or equal to num2, and if it's greater than or equal to num3. But let's say that this isn't true, right? So let's say that num1 isn't the biggest. Well, I can actually come down here and I can say else if. So I basically wanna check another condition. So if num1's not the biggest, let's check to see if num2 is the biggest. So I can just say num2 greater than or equal to num1 and num2 greater than or equal to num3. And basically if this condition is true, that means that num2 is the biggest, right? Because it's bigger than num1 and it's bigger than num2 or greater than or equal to. And over here I can just return num2 because that means num2 is the biggest. Then finally, we can just make an else and I can say else, let's return num3. And this one's a lot easier because if num1's not the biggest and num2's not the biggest, then we're only left with one option, which is num3 being the biggest. So by process of elimination, we figured out that num3 is the biggest. All right, so now we have our updated get max function. Let's come down here and we'll test it out. So 390 and let's make one more in here. Why don't we do like 400? So now this should give us back a 400, hopefully. So over here, I'm gonna refresh the page and you'll see we're getting back 400. So even with three inputs, our function was still able to run. Why don't we try to make this one the biggest, the middle one, so we should get 900. And let's make the first one the biggest now, and we'll get 3,000. Cool, and then we could check to see if it's still gonna work if two of them are equal. So we'll make this one 3,000 as well, and we're still getting 3,000. So. Looks like our function is working. We tested out all the different possibilities and um, we were able to be successful. So down here, you'll notice that I used these comparison operators and that's what they're called. They're called comparison operators. So things like greater than or equal to, um, right. So we have greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, and then we have less than or equal to. And in addition to those, we also have a double equals, which is gonna mean they're equal. So this is basically saying if num1 is equal to num2, that's gonna be a double equals. We can also use an exclamation point equals, which is gonna check not equals. So this is gonna, this whole thing over here is gonna be true if num1 is not equal to num2. So those are all the different comparison operators that we have. And in addition to doing this with like numbers, we could also check to see if like two strings are equal. So I could like check to see if one string is equal to another string. Um, you can use basically all the data types inside of these comparisons. But hopefully that gives you a sort of an idea of how we can use comparisons inside of our programs. Honestly, you're gonna be using comparisons all the time with if statements. So you wanna make sure that you have a firm grasp on how to use them. 
In this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how to build a four function calculator in PHP. Now, if you've been following along with this course, you'll know that in the beginning of the course, we actually created a very basic calculator. And the calculator basically just allowed the user to enter in two numbers. We took those numbers and then we added them together and printed the answer out onto the screen. In this tutorial though, I'm gonna show you guys how we can build a fully functional calculator, which can do not only addition, but subtraction, multiplication, and division. And we're gonna allow the user to decide which operation they wanna perform. So this is gonna be pretty cool. And we'll get to use um, if statements in order to do this. So down here inside of this program, I have this form that I set up in my HTML. And the action is just site.php, that's this file and then the method is post, and then I have this submit button. So the first thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do if I'm gonna build this calculator is I'm gonna to wanna to be able to get information from the user. And actually for this particular calculator, we're looking for three pieces of information. We're looking for the first number, we're looking for the second number, and we're also looking for the operation that they wanna perform. So not only do I wanna know what two numbers they wanna use, but I also wanna know if they wanna add, subtract, multiply, or divide. So we're gonna create input boxes for all of those different things. So I'm just gonna say input type is gonna be equal to number. So we're gonna use this to get the first number and then I'm gonna give this a name and I'm just gonna set it equal to num1. And then I'm just gonna put a break over here. So this is gonna allow us to get num1 and I'll basically just say first num. And then what I'm basically just gonna do is copy this and we can use this same template to get the second number. So over here, I'll just make a new line and we'll paste this down here for the second number. So now we're able to get the first number and we're able to get the second number. I'm gonna change this to num2. And the last thing we wanna do is we want to get the operator. So I'm just gonna say OP and that's gonna stand for operator. And I'm actually gonna create another input and I'm just gonna say type and we're gonna set this one equal to text box. So we're gonna allow the user to type in like a plus sign, a minus sign, a multiplication sign, or a division sign. And then over here, I'm just gonna say name, and we're just gonna say this is gonna be OP, once again, for operator, and then we'll put a break over here. So I have three input boxes, the first num, second num, and the operator. These two are getting a number, and this one over here is just getting text. And actually, this should just be text, not text box, my bad. So now we're able to get information from the user. And if you see over here on my webpage, that should all work out. So we have you know boxes for each of these different inputs, and then we have our submit button. So our job now is to get that information. Um, I'm actually gonna store it inside of different variables, and then we need to figure out what operation they wanted us to perform. So down here, let's just create a few different variables. So I'm gonna create a variable um, we'll just call it num1, and I'm gonna set this equal to whatever the user entered. So it's gonna be post, and we're gonna get the number from the num1 um, number box, and then I'm gonna do the same thing for num2. So I'll say num2 is gonna be equal to post and num2. And then finally, I'm gonna do the same thing for the operator. So I'm just gonna say op, which is gonna stand for operator, is gonna be equal to post, and here we're just gonna get OP. So these two are gonna be numbers, and this one is gonna be a string of text. So what we wanna do now is we wanna figure out what operation the user wanted to perform. In other words, we have these two numbers, right? And it doesn't really matter what those are, but we also have this operator. And in order to figure out if we need to add the numbers, subtract them, multiply them, etc we need to figure out what's inside of there. In other words, we need to figure out if it's a plus sign or if it's a minus sign. And in order to do that, we can use an if statement. So by using an if statement, we'll allow our program to respond to this value. So down here, I can just say if, I'll make an open and close parentheses, open and close curly bracket. And the first thing I wanna do is check to see if this is a plus sign. So I can basically just say if op is equal to a plus sign. And if the operator is equal to a plus sign, then we can basically just echo out num1 plus num2. So if it's a plus sign, then we'll just write out the answer. So it's gonna be num1 plus num2. And then we can keep checking different things. So if that's not the case, then I can say else if, and I'll come down here and I'll check to see if the operator is equal to a minus sign. 
If the operator is equal to a minus sign, then we can just echo out num1 minus num2. Because if this condition over here is true, that means we want to subtract the numbers. And I can actually do the same thing for division and multiplication. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it down here because we're basically doing the same thing. And I'm just going to say division sign. So I'm going to do that forward slash and I'm going to make a forward slash here. And then I'll paste this one more time for multiplication. So here it's going to be an asterisk. And then down here we will multiply them. So this if statement is basically checking if it's a plus sign. If it's not, it's checking if it's a minus sign. Then it's checking if it's a division sign or a multiplication sign. But there's also one more situation that could occur. And that's when the user entered in an invalid operator. So they didn't enter in one of these four up here. So we can just say else. And then down here, I can just echo out an error message. So I could just echo out like invalid operator, right? So that'll cover the case where the user entered in an invalid operator. So basically this if statement is going to allow me to figure out what's inside of the operator variable. In other words, it'll allow me to figure out what the user entered as an operator. And depending on what they entered, I can perform that operation down here. So this should be fully functional. Why don't we refresh the page and we'll go ahead and run this program. So you can see down here, it's saying invalid operator. That's basically just because I haven't entered anything yet. So if I come up here, I can say first num, why don't we say this is going to be 10. And why don't we do addition? And then the second number is going to be like 35. So now when I click submit, it should add those numbers together. So it's going to look through that if statement, figure out which operator we submitted, and it's going to do the operation for us. When I click submit, you see we get 35. So why don't we do 30 and we'll multiply 30 by two. So now we should get 60 and you can see down here that we do. So that's actually working pretty well. Let's do one more. So I'm going to say like 45 and let's make the operator like some nonsense like draft. And then we'll just say 35, 35. So this is actually going to be an invalid operator. So our program will recognize that and it will show us. So down here, we were able to use this if statement in order to figure out what the operator was that the user entered. And that is actually pretty awesome. So hopefully you can see how that works and you can kind of see like, you know, how something like this could be useful. And I also want to show you guys um, one more thing. And this isn't like directly related to this calculator, but it's a little thing that I think some people might be confused about. So actually, if I came over here into my calculator program and I entered in like a decimal number, so if I entered in something like 4.6 and I click submit, you'll see that we're actually getting this error here and it says, please enter a valid value. Um, and actually let me do it again. So we get that um, the nearest values are four and five. So it didn't actually let me um, put in here a decimal number. And that's actually has to do with um, how HTML works. And it basically just has to do with how this input tag works over here. So by default, when we say number, this is only going to take like whole numbers. Um, but we can actually modify that so we could make it so we could use decimal numbers. So I could just say over here step and I could set this equal to like 0 0.1, for example. And now this is going to specify that we can take numbers um, to this decimal point. So we could basically say numbers to the tens place. So over here now I should be able to enter in a 4.6 um, with no problem. So I could say like 4.6 plus um, 5.0 and it'll be able to do that math for us. But you'll notice if I tried to do like 4.567, this is going to throw an error again because the step is not that significant. So if I said step is 0 0.001, now I'm going to be able to enter in a number just like this. So I could say like 4.567 plus and I could do like nine and now it'll be able to add these numbers together. So that's not necessarily like a PHP limitation. That's more of an HTML limitation. Um, but if you were a little bit confused about that, hopefully um, that clears it up a little bit. But you know, the main point of this tutorial was to kind of show you guys how we could use an if statement to figure out what a user inputted into our program. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about switch statements in PHP. Now, a switch statement is basically just a special type of if statement 
which we can use to compare one value to a bunch of different values. So there's certain circumstances when we want to use the functionality of an if statement, but we want to check a bunch of different cases. And in a situation like that, we can use a switch statement in order to make it a lot easier. So I'm going to show you guys how to use switch statements and we'll kind of, I'll show you guys an example in this tutorial that will hopefully illustrate it. So over here in my program, I have a, a basic little program set up. Basically, I have this form over here and I'm asking the user what their grade was. So this is a program where the user can enter in their grade and it'll basically like tell them what they got. So the user could enter in a grade that they got on a test, for example. And then down here, I'm storing the grade that they enter inside of this grade variable and I'm just printing it out onto the screen. So it's very simple. And over here, I'll show you guys how it works. So let's say I got an A plus on my test. I could put A plus in here and then I could click submit and it'll just print it out down there. So this is a pretty simple program, um, but we're actually gonna make it a little bit more interesting with switch statements. So let's say that instead of just printing out the grade that they got, instead, we wanted to tell them how they did. So if the user got like an A, then we could basically be like, hey, you did really well on this test. Or if the user got a B, we could be like, hey, you did all right. Or if they got a C, we could be like, you could do better next time. And if they got an F, we could tell them that they failed. So in other words, what if we can make our program be able to respond to the grade that the user got? Well, I'm gonna show you guys how we can do that really easily with something called a switch statement. And like I said, a switch statement is very similar to an if statement. It's basically another way that we can allow our program to respond to different information. Um, a switch statement though is used in a situation like this where we wanna compare the grade to a bunch of different um, possible values. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do this. I'm just gonna come down here and we'll set up the switch statement. So you're just gonna type out switch and open and close parentheses and an open and close curly bracket. Now, inside of these parentheses, I want to put a value. So what we could actually do is we could put this grade right here. So I'm just gonna pass in um, dollar sign grade. And basically what this means is that we're gonna compare the grade to a bunch of different things. And depending on whether or not it's equal to those things, then we'll do you know something here or there. So inside of this switch statement, I can create something called a case. So I just wanna type out case, and then I'm gonna type out a capital A, just like this, and then I'll type out a, a colon. Basically what this means is that in the case that the grade is equal to A, I can come down here and I can actually type out some code. So I could just type out like echo, and I'll just say, you did amazing. And then I can just put a semicolon here. And then I'm gonna say break right here. And I'll explain to you guys what break does in a second. Basically what this is saying though, is it's saying that in the case that grade is equal to an uppercase A, then we're gonna type out you did amazing. So actually let's go ahead and try this out. So over here, I'm gonna go ahead and type in an A. So I'm actually gonna refresh the page and I'll put a capital A in here. Now when I click submit, Instead of just printing out capital A, it's gonna print out, you did amazing, right? So it's actually able to respond to the value that I put in there. If I put like a B in here, for example, though, and I click submit, it's not printing out anything, right? That's because I didn't tell it to do anything. But what I could do is I could create another case for B. So I could come down here and say case, and then capital B, and I'll type a colon, and now I could type out echo, you did pretty good. And then once again, I'm gonna say break down here. So now if I go over to my program and I refresh the page and I was typing in a B, now it's gonna tell me you did pretty good. So if I type in a capital A, it says you did amazing. If I type in a capital B, it says you did pretty good. So it's actually able to respond to the different grade that I got. And so what I could do is I could basically create one of these cases for all of the possible grades. Now I wanna explain one more thing, which is this break statement. And this break statement is basically a statement that will break us out of a programming structure. So switch over here is a programming structure, right? We're in here in between these open and close um, curly brackets. And when we put break here, it basically will break us out of the switch statement. So for example, let's say that the grade was equal to A, right? So this case was true and we came down here and we printed out, you are amazing. If I didn't put a break statement here, then this switch statement would keep executing. So even though I 
figured out that the grade was an A, I would keep looking through all of the other cases. So the reason we put a break here is because once we've figured out that the grade was equal to A, I don't wanna check any more cases, right? So I'm just gonna put a break there and it'll break us out. Now you don't need to put the break there, but um, a lot of times people will just because it's more useful. So I can create a case for all the possible grades. So I could create one for C, D, and F. And I'm actually gonna go off, I'm gonna do that, and then we'll come back and we'll see what I did. All right, so I went ahead and I created cases for most of the common grades. So I have one for A, B, C, D, and F. So for each one of these grades, it's basically giving you a different message. If you get a D, it says you did very bad. If you get a C, it says you did poorly. If you get an F, it says you fail. And we have cases for all of these possible grades. So now, if I actually came over here into my program, this thing will be able to respond to a lot of different grades. So I'm gonna refresh the page and we'll just click continue. And now if I typed in like an F for example and I click submit, it's gonna tell me that you fail. If I type in a C, it'll say you did poorly. If I type in an A, it'll say you did amazing. If I typed in a B, it's gonna say you did pretty good. Um, there's one problem with this program though, and if I type in a, a grade, like an invalid grade, for example, if I typed in a G right here and I click submit, you'll notice that nothing's getting printed out, right? So no error is getting thrown, like the program is still running, but nothing is actually getting printed out. And the problem is that we're not handling that situation. So over here in this case statement, we don't have a case for like every possible input. But if the input isn't one of these valid grades, maybe we could like tell the user, hey, you entered in an invalid grade. And to do that, I could actually come down here and use what's called a default statement. So I could just type out default and I'm gonna type a colon. And then down here, I can basically just type out something I wanna do. Um, so I could just say like invalid grade. And essentially what this is gonna do is um, when none of these cases up here are true, in other words, when it's not A, B, C, D, or F, then we're gonna go ahead and execute this code and it's just gonna say invalid grade. So now when I come over here to my program and I type in, like if I typed in an A, it's still gonna tell me that I did amazing. But if I typed in a G, now it's gonna tell me that I had an invalid grade. So that default um, case is actually gonna get executed for us. So that's kind of how we can use these switch statements. And like I said, a switch statement is very similar to an if statement. In fact, everything that you can do with a switch statement, you could do with an if statement. It's just that switch statements make it a lot easier for us to do that. And really switch statements are used in a situation where you have one value like the grade and you wanna compare it to a bunch of different values. So switch statements are very useful and there's tons of situations where these will come in handy. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys how to use while loops in PHP. A while loop is basically just a programming structure which allows us to loop over a specified block of code while a certain condition is true. Basically loops allow us to just keep repeating something as long as a certain condition is true. So I'm gonna show you guys in this tutorial the basics of working with while loops. We'll kind of look at what they're doing, how they work, the ins and outs of um, what they are. And then we'll also look at a couple of variations on the while loop, specifically something called the do while loop. So this is gonna be a pretty fun tutorial. Down here in my little PHP tags, I'm gonna actually show you guys a while loop. So before I do that though, I'm gonna create a variable and I'm just gonna call this index and I'm gonna set it equal to one. So this is a very simple variable. I'm just storing a number inside of it. And then down here, I'm actually gonna create a while loop. And you guys will see how that index variable comes into play in a second. If I wanna create a while loop, I can just type out while, open and close parentheses, and an open and close curly bracket. Now, like I said, a while loop is basically a structure which we can use to loop over a certain block of code while a certain condition is true. So there's gonna be certain things in PHP that we wanna just like continuously do, and a while loop can allow us to do that. There's two parts to the while loop. The first is called the loop condition, and the second part is called the loop body. And the loop condition is a lot like a condition in an if statement. So if you're familiar with an if statement, um, basically the first thing we need to put in an if statement is a condition. And that condition will tell the if statement whether or not we should execute the code in between the curly brackets. It's the same for a while loop. 
In a while loop, we're going to specify a condition inside of these parentheses. And that condition is going to determine whether or not we should keep executing the code in between the curly brackets. So I'm going to create a very simple condition. I'm just going to say while index is less than or equal to five. So this is basically saying that I'm going to keep looping through this while loop as long as the value stored inside of the index variable is less than or equal to five. And then down here inside of these curly brackets, I can specify some code that I want to be continually executed over as long as this condition is true. So I'm basically just going to print out the value of index. So I'm just going to print out um, index and then I'm also going to print a break statement just so this is a little bit easier to see. All right. And then one more thing underneath this echo statement, I also want to increment the index variable. So I can just say index plus plus. And if you remember, when we say index plus plus, this is the same as saying index is equal to index plus one. So I'm essentially just incrementing this variable by one. So every time we go through this while loop, this index variable is going to get incremented. So the first time we go through the loop, it'll be equal to one. And the second time it'll be equal to two, etc. So I'm going to show you guys exactly how this works. I'm going to come over here and refresh my page. And you'll see we're actually printing out one, two, three, four, five. So maybe this is what you expected. Maybe it's not what you expected. But let me go ahead and explain why this is happening. So over here, I create this variable called index, right? And it's basically just a simple variable it's storing the value one. And now I create my while loop. So remember, there's two parts to the while loop. We have the loop condition up here. And this basically determines whether or not we should keep looping through the loop. And then down here we have the loop body. Whenever we're using a while loop, the first thing that PHP is going to do is it's going to check this condition. So before PHP does anything else, before it executes any of this code, it's going to check this condition. So it's going to check to see if index is less than or equal to five. If index is less than or equal to five, then we're going to go through and we're going to execute all of the code in this loop body. So over here, we start with index equal to one. So the first time we go through the loop, index is equal to one. So we're going to be able to pass this condition. This condition is going to be true. And then we're going to print out one. So you can see over here, we're printing out one. Then we're going to increment the index variable. So now the index variable is going to be equal to two. Once we've executed all of the code inside of this loop body, we're going to jump all the way back up and we're going to check this condition again. So before we can execute the code inside of the loop body, we have to check the condition. So on every single iteration of the loop, we're going to check that condition first. If the condition is true, we're going to execute the loop body. Otherwise, we're going to break out of the loop and we'll be done. So the second time we're going to print out two. The third time through the loop, we're going to print out three, four, and then five. Because every time I go through the loop, I'm continuously incrementing the index variable. Eventually, we're going to get to a point where index is equal to five. We're going to come down here. We're going to print five out. And then five is going to get incremented up to six. And then we're going to come up here and check the condition. And six is not less than or equal to five. So then we're going to break out of the while loop and we'll be done. And that's the basics of how this while loop works. We define a looping condition. As long as that condition's true, we're going to go through and execute the code inside of here. So it's actually very simple when you think about it. And while loops are extremely powerful and there's a lot of stuff that we can do with them. Now, I do want to point one thing out and this is kind of like a warning. Um, sometimes you'll run into a situation which is referred to as an infinite loop. And an infinite loop is a situation where the condition up here inside of these parentheses is never going to be false. So sometimes like you'll run into a situation where you forget to increment something or you forget to change a specific value um, or a value just never changes. And this condition up here just stays true forever. Basically, what that means is your loop is just going to keep looping infinitely. And we call that an infinite loop. So let me demonstrate. If I was to get rid of this um, line of code right here where it says index plus plus, right? I'm actually incrementing the index variable there. If I got rid of that, then index is always going to be one, right? It's never getting modified. So this condition up here is always going to be true because index is always going to be equal to one. So now if I came over here in my browser and I click the refresh button, you'll notice that it's just a bunch of ones down here. And you can see over here, like I could scroll down infinitely and it's just going to keep being ones. Basically what happened is my program is running and it's just continually printing out ones 
onto the HTML document. Now, I'm just gonna go ahead and terminate this, so I clicked that little X up here. You don't wanna let a loop like this run because it could slow down your computer significantly, but I just kinda wanted to demonstrate how something like that could mess up your program. So I'm gonna add this back in and now we'll go back to the normal program. Um, infinite loops happen to everybody, and as you you know start learning more about while loops, I'm sure they'll happen to you. Um, but it's just something to be aware of, where if something's not working correctly, it might be because an infinite loop is occurring. So a while loop is very simple, and you know we kind of looked at how they work. I want to talk to you guys about one other type of loop though, and it's actually similar to a while loop, and it's called a do while loop. So in order to illustrate what the do while loop does, I'm actually going to show you guys a little um, example. We're going to do a little experiment. I'm going to set index up here equal to six. So index initially has a value of six. Now remember, whenever we're using this while loop, the first thing that we do is check the loop condition. So before I go through and I execute all of this code, I always check this condition first. And that is extremely important that we do that. If I set index equal to six, well, we're never gonna be able to execute the code down here because it's not gonna pass this condition. So the first thing it's gonna do is check to see if index is less than or equal to five, which it's not. So we're not gonna end up executing any of this code. So if I was to run my program now, you'll see that we're not printing anything out, right? That's because we never ran this echo command, so we never printed out the value of index. There's actually another type of loop though, which I wanna show you called a do while loop. So I'm actually just gonna take this line right here and I'm gonna paste it down here below. So I'm pasting it right after this um, closing curly bracket. And then I always wanna make sure that I put a semicolon there on the end. And then up here in front of this opening curly bracket, I'm gonna say do. And essentially what we have here is a do while loop. And a do while loop is exactly the same as a while loop, except the order is reversed. So instead of checking the condition first and then executing the loop body, we're gonna execute the loop body first and then check the condition. So there's certain circumstances where you're not gonna to wanna to check the condition first, you're gonna to wanna to do something first and then check the condition, and that's where do while loops can come in handy. So even though I have index equal to six up here and it's technically not gonna pass this condition, what you'll see is we're still gonna be able to print it out down here. And that's because in a do while loop, we're executing the code inside of the loop body before we check the condition. So now when I run my program, you'll see I'm able to print out six. So all of this code gets executed, then we check the condition to see if we can execute it again. And since six is greater than five, we just break out of the loop. And so that's sort of the difference between while loops and do while loops. With a while loop, we always check that condition first and then execute the loop body. In a do while loop, we execute the loop body first and then check the condition. I think probably for the most part, you're gonna be encountering while loops a lot more than you will do while loops. Um, do while loops are more in a specific circumstance, but you will find do while loops out there in the world. So if you see them now, you'll know the difference. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about for loops in PHP. Well, for loop is a special type of loop which is used in conjunction with an indexing variable. And basically what's special about for loops is that they allow you to keep track of a specific variable as you go through your loop. So if you've been following along with this course, in the last tutorial, I showed you guys how you could use while loops and do while loops. And while loops and do while loops are awesome, um, but a while loop is just a very general type of looping structure. So a while loop can basically handle any situation where you wanna loop over a specific block of code um, a number of times. And while loops are really powerful in that sense, but they're also really general. And there's actually another type of loop in PHP, which is called a for loop. And a for loop serves more of a specific purpose. In a for loop, not only can we loop while a, con a certain condition is true, but as we go through our loop, we can keep track of something called an iterating variable. So I'm gonna kind of show you guys how this works. We'll talk about um, the difference between a for loop and a while loop, and we can kind of look at how we can use for loops in PHP. All right, so down here in my program, I basically just have this while loop that I was using in the last tutorial. And essentially what this is doing is it's just looping five times. So I have this variable index, I set it equal to one, and I'm saying while index is less than or equal to five, we're gonna basically print out the value of index and then increment index. So 
over here you'll see that when I print this out, we get like one, two, three, four, five. So I'm basically just printing out um, numbers one through five. And actually this is a very common situation. So I kind of want to point out what's happening here. This variable index is actually keeping track how many times we've gone through the loop. So on the first iteration of this while loop, index has a value of one. On the second iteration of this while loop, index has a value of two. On the third iteration of the loop, index has a value of three. Index is actually keeping track of how many times we've gone through the loop. And index is actually what we would consider a indexing variable or an iterating variable. Basically, this is a variable that's changing every time we go through this loop. So every time I execute the code inside this while loop, you'll see that this index variable is actually changing. So it's incrementing. We could also decrement it if we want. We could add five to it. It's basically just a variable that's changing every time we go through the loop. And these indexing variables can be extremely useful when we're working with loops. And because this is such a common and sought after situation, there's actually a special type of loop called a for loop, which is designed specifically for using an iterating variable like index. So I'm going to show you guys um, how we can use a for loop and we can essentially use a for loop to do exactly what this while loop is doing. So down here below this while loop, I'm actually going to create a for loop. So I'm just going to come down here and say for, and let me bring this over here for, I'm going to make an open and closed parentheses and an open and closed curly bracket. So, so far the while loop and the for loop look pretty similar, right? The for loop has a similar structure. We have this open and closed parentheses and these open and closed curly brackets, but there's actually some key differences. Um, and the biggest difference is that inside of this while loops parentheses, we're specifying one thing. So we're specifying the looping condition, but inside of this for loops parentheses, we're actually going to specify three separate things. So the for loops parentheses is going to be a little bit more complex than the while loops parentheses. So the first thing that we want to put inside of this for loops parentheses is going to be a variable initialization. Now, one thing I want you guys to notice up here with this while loop is I actually had to create this indexing variable up here. So outside of the while loop, I had to create a variable, give it a value, and then I was able to use it inside the loop. Well, in a for loop, instead of having to place this outside of the loop, we can actually do it right here in the parentheses. So the first thing that we're going to do for this for loop is I'm basically going to create a variable. So I can just say dollar sign and I'm going to call this variable I. So this is going to do the same thing as this index variable up here. I'm just going to call it I and I'm going to give it a value. So I'm going to set it equal to one and then I'm going to put a semicolon right there. So the first thing I'm doing inside these parentheses is I'm creating a variable called I and I'm giving it a value of one, just like I did up here for my while loop. The second thing I want to put inside of this parentheses is going to be the looping condition. So over here in the while loop, my loop condition is actually right here in these parentheses. So that's the second thing that I want to put in the for loops parentheses. And you'll notice that I'm putting this semicolon here to separate. And now I'm going to specify the looping condition. So I could just say I want to loop while the variable I is less than or equal to five. So this is the same exact condition as I had up here. It's just now we're using this I variable instead of the index variable. And then once again, just like I did over here, I also want to put a semicolon here. And now I want to do one more thing. I'm going to put one more thing over here in this parentheses. And this is going to be essentially just a line of code that I want to execute after every iteration of the loop. Now you'll notice over here in this while loop, every time I go through the loop, I'm incrementing the index variable. So every single time we go through the loop, we add one to that index variable. And that's essentially what I want to put over here. So this is going to be a line of code that will get executed after every iteration of the loop. And generally what we're going to be doing is we're going to be modifying this indexing variable in some way. So over here, I'm just going to say I plus plus. And basically this is going to do the same thing as it does over here. This is going to tell PHP that every time I go through the for loop, I want to increment it. I want to add one to it. So that's going to be extremely useful. And now this for loop is actually set up identically to this while loop. And all I have to do is I could actually just do the same line of code. I could say echo and I could just print out I and then a break. So these loops right now for all intents and purposes are 
exactly the same. They're doing exactly the same thing. So they're equivalent. The while loop up here and the for loop. The difference is though, this while loop takes up one, two, three, four lines of code. This for loop really only takes up two lines of code, right? And so this for loop is essentially doing the same thing as this while loop, but it's just way more compact, it's way more streamlined, and it's a lot easier for us to do this. So once again, over here, we have this variable. So we're creating our indexing variable, just like we did up there. We're specifying our looping condition, just like we did up here. And then we're specifying a line of code that we want to execute after every iteration of the loop, just like we did over here. So now I could actually get rid of this while loop altogether. And I'm actually just going to run my program and you'll see, we're going to get the same exact output because it's doing the same exact thing. It's just that this for loop is way cleaner, way more streamlined and way more optimized. And really the benefit and the advantage of using the for loop is that we can keep track of this variable. So I have now this indexing or this iterating variable that I can, you know, basically modify and, and do whatever I want with. All right. So using this for loop, I want to actually show you guys how we can loop through the contents of an array. And this is actually a very, very common use case for a for loop. It'll kind of give you guys an idea of how these for loops can be used. So I'm actually going to create an array and I'm just going to call it lucky numbers. And I'm just going to set it equal to array open and close parentheses. And then in here we can just put a bunch of numbers. So I'm going to say like four, eight, 15, 16, 23, 42. So I have a bunch of numbers in here, just six numbers. And I want to show you guys how we can use this for loop in order to print out all the numbers in the lucky numbers array. Now, just to kind of refresh your memory, whenever we have an array, if I wanted to access like a specific element, I could just say lucky numbers and then I could put an index in here. So if I wanted to access this first element, I could just put a zero in here and that would give me access to this first element. So I'm going to show you guys how we can use this for loop to print out all the elements in here. The first thing I want to do is instead of starting I off at one, I actually want to start I off at zero. And that's because array indexes start at zero. So the first element in the array is actually at index position zero. The next thing I want to do is modify my looping condition. Right now it says I want to keep looping as long as I is less than or equal to five. But really, if I'm going to loop through all the elements in this array and print them out, I want to keep looping as long as I is less than count lucky numbers. And basically this is going to tell me how many elements are inside this lucky numbers array. So this should actually give us a six because there's six elements inside of here. And then just like before, we're going to increment by one. Now down here, instead of just printing out I, I actually want to print out lucky numbers, square brackets, and now we're going to print out I. So I'm printing out lucky numbers at index position I, and I'm going to go ahead and run this and you guys will see essentially what's happening. So I'm going to refresh the program and you can see we're printing out all of the numbers that were inside of that array. So essentially what's happening is the first time that we go through this array, I is equal to zero. So the first time we're actually printing out lucky numbers zero. The second time we go through the array, I gets incremented. So I is now equal to one. So we're printing out lucky numbers one, and we're going to keep doing that until we get to the end. And remember, even though there's technically six elements inside of this array, the index position of the last element is actually five. So lucky numbers five is actually this 42. So actually what we can do is we can get rid of this less than or equals and we could actually just say less than because we don't need to go all the way up to six. We only need to stop at five. So now if I was to say like dollar sign I, this is going to do exactly the same thing as you can see over there. So one more time, I'm just going to walk you guys through what we have here. We started I off at zero because array indexes start at zero. We said percent I is less than count lucky numbers because we wanted to loop through all of the numbers in the lucky numbers array. And then we said I plus plus. 
In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about using comments in PHP. A comment is basically just a line of code inside of our PHP file, which isn't gonna get rendered by PHP. So generally when we're writing um, lines of code inside of our PHP files, like they are instructions that are meant for the computer to carry out. So I can have an instruction down here like echo and that's meant for the computer, right? I'm telling the computer, I'm telling PHP to do something. But a lot of times in our programs, there's gonna be situations where we want to write out little notes or little reminders for ourselves or for other developers. And to do that, we can use something called a comment. So a comment is basically any text inside of our PHP file that's not meant for the computer, it's meant for us humans. And we can create a comment pretty simply. All you have to do is just type two forward slashes, just like this. And I can come over here and I'm typing a comment. And you'll notice just in my text editor that this comment is actually colored a little bit different than um, some of the code that's down here. And that's really because this is now a comment. So the text that I put after these two forward slashes is no longer an instruction that's meant for the computer. Now it's basically just plain text that I as the developer or the programmer can use and sort of look at. So you can use comments to leave little notes. You could leave like a little to do stub here. Um, you could also do other stuff. So a lot of times people will use comments to like describe a line of code. So I could describe this line of code down here. I could say like, this line prints out a string, right? So I'm basically like describing what it's doing. Um, you can also use these comments after a line of code. So after here, I could say like two forward slashes, and now I'm typing a comment once again. So anything that comes after these two forward slashes is gonna be considered a comment. Um, the thing is though, these are only gonna work on a single line. So if I was to come down here and start typing, you'll see now this is in no longer considered a comment. So only the stuff that's on the same line as these two forward slashes is gonna be a comment. In a lot of situations, you're gonna to wanna to have comments that span multiple lines. So one thing you can do is just have multiple lines with forward slashes on them. So I could do something like that, and you can see I'm printing on multiple lines. Another thing you can do though is use starting and ending comment tags. And these are what we would call comment blocks. It's basically just gonna be a block where you can put uh, you know, as many comments and as many lines of comments as you want. To make a comment block, you can just type a forward slash, an asterisk, and now you'll see after I typed this in, everything down here changed color. Everything basically became a comment. That is until I make another asterisk and another forward slash. And so now only things that are in between this starting and this ending tag are gonna be considered comments. But you can see like I can write on as many multiple lines as I want. Like this now this whole thing in between these comment blocks is going to be considered a comment. So that's kind of the basics of working with comments. And really a comment is extremely open-ended. I mean, it's just anything that's not gonna get rendered by the computer. So any text that you wanna put in there, any notes, any, you know, you can write logs in there. I mean, you can do whatever you want with a comment. It is completely open-ended. Um, but I do wanna show you guys one thing that a lot of developers will use comments for. Um, and it's actually to do what's called commenting out a line of code. So a lot of times when you're writing your PHP programs, you might have a line of code which you think is kind of causing trouble. So maybe you have a line and you think that line is breaking your program or something. So a lot of times you're gonna to wanna to try to test your programs without those specific lines of code. And let's say that like this line of code down here, like I think maybe it's causing problems in my program. Well, one thing I could do is I could just delete it and then I could come over here and run my program and that line is no longer getting executed, right? Um, but here's the problem with that is I have to actually like physically delete the line of code. Another thing you can do instead of having to delete the line of code is just comment this out. So I could actually just put a comment in front of this and now this whole thing is a comment. And so instead of having to delete the line of code, we're gonna get the same result where this line of code doesn't get executed but without having to delete it. So this line of code is no longer gonna get rendered by um, PHP because it's technically a comment, but I don't have to actually physically delete it from the file. So that's what we would call commenting out a line of code, and that can be really useful. But like I said, I mean, comments are very open-ended. I mean, you, you can do whatever you want with a comment and you can really just use them to help yourself out. 
In this tutorial, I want to talk to you guys about using the include statement in PHP. Now, the include statement basically allows us to include another file inside of our PHP file. So I could set up like another PHP file or an HTML file, and then I could use this include keyword in order to essentially just use all of the code from that other file in my current file. And this is a huge topic and it's extremely useful in PHP. And in this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys just a very basic use case. Um, essentially, we're going to define a header and a footer for our website. And then we're actually gonna be able to include that header and footer um, inside of our PHP file. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can do this. Now, down here, I just have a very simple file setup. It's just my HTML file. And let's say that when I'm creating my website, I want all the pages on my website to have the same header and have the same footer. So imagine that I had like 100 pages on my website and I wanted all of them to have, like I said, the same header and the same footer. And if I wanted to be able to change that header and footer, like I wouldn't wanna to have to go and change it on 100 different places. So what we can actually do in PHP is we could write a HTML file for the header of our website. We could write an HTML file for the footer of our website. And then using PHP, we could include the contents of those files into each one of our web pages. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can do this and it's actually pretty useful. Over here in my little file explorer, I actually created two files. I created this footer.html file and this header.html file. Now these are like the world's simplest HTML files. Um, the header is basically just a header one, and then we have a horizontal rule, it says Mike's website, and the footer is, again, just a horizontal rule, and then it says, thanks for visiting. So, you know, obviously in your own website, you can make the header and the footer as complex as your heart desires. For the purposes of this tutorial, though, I just created some simple headers and footers. So let's say that those were gonna be the headers and the footers for every page on my website. And right, so every single content page that I created on my website, I wanted that to be the header and the footer. Well, what I could do is I could actually come down here in my PHP and I could do something called uh, including those files. And essentially what this will do is it'll go out, grab all the code from those files and place it here into this PHP file. And inside of these PHP tags, I can just say include and then inside of quotation marks, I basically just wanna type in the name of the file. So I'm just gonna go ahead and type in header.html. So all I had to do was just say include header.html. And now all of a sudden, when I refresh my browser over here, you guys will see that that header is actually gonna show up in my website. So now without having to type out any of the code for the header, without having to do anything, all I had to do was just say include header.html. And now I have all of the code for the header of my website right here. Another thing I could do is include the footer. So again, I can just kind of copy this guy and we'll come down here. And now I'm gonna include footer.html. And you'll see over here, we should get that footer on the website. Yeah, so now we have the header, the horizontal rule, and then the horizontal rule for the footer. And it says, thanks for visiting. So what I could do now is I could come in here and I could, you know, basically create my HTML file. So I could, you know, write out some text, whatever. Maybe I'm writing like an article or something. And that's gonna go ahead and show up in between the header and the footer. And this is really useful because what you could do is you could basically just include the header and include the footer on every single PHP file that you make. So all the different pages on your website, you can include the header and you can include the footer, and then your header and your footer will automatically show up on all of those files. But what's cool about this is if I wanted to modify the header or the footer, all I have to do is come over here into this file and modify it. So instead of saying Mike's website, we could say like Mike's cool website, right? So I'm, I updated the header, I made a simple change, and I actually don't have to change any of the code inside of this site.php file. I don't have to touch it, and the header is automatically gonna update when I refresh my page. So you see over here, now it says Mike's cool website. But I didn't have to modify any of the code in here. And the point is that if you are including the header on like 100 or 200 pages in your website, and you wanted to change it, you only have to change it in one spot, and it will automatically update on all of those other pages in your website. And that's why this is so powerful. So what a lot of people will do is they'll break up their website into little reusable components. So they'll you know, place the header of their website in its own file, the footer of their website in its own file, 
maybe you have like a navigation list or like breadcrumbs or something, you know, essentially you can place any of those things inside of their own files. And then you'll be able to use all of those different HTML components inside of your websites. So these includes are extremely useful and there's a lot of circumstances where you guys are going to want to do this. And really what this does is it makes your website more modular. So you can break your website up into these little, you know, components, and then you can just insert them into your different pages using those include statements. But really this is just scratching the surface of what these includes can do. And so in the following tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys some more about what these includes can do. And more specifically, we're gonna talk about not just including HTML files, but also including PHP files. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you guys some more things we can do using that include statement in PHP. So the include statement is really awesome because it basically allows us to go out to another file and grab all the information in that file and include it in our own file. So in the last tutorial, I showed you guys how we could use include in order to go out and grab um, HTML from all these separate files and we can bring it all together and sort of like scaffold out um, our website. And in this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how we can take that a step further and actually include other PHP files inside of our PHP file. And what you'll see is when we include other PHP files, things start to get really awesome. The first thing I'm going to do is show you guys how we can create a PHP file. And then I'm going to show you how we can actually include it here in our PHP. And I'll show you some cool stuff that we can do with it. So over here, I'm actually going to create a new PHP file. So I just have this site.php file and I'm gonna come up here and we'll just make a new file. And I'm gonna go ahead and call this article header.php. So basically this is going to be a file which is going to act as like the header for an article. So let's say that we were writing a blog or something and every blog post was gonna have like a specific header. And let's say that we want all of the headers on our website to look the same. So I want all the blog headers on the website to sort of have the same look and feel. This is the file where we can kind of define that look and feel. So what I wanna do is I'm basically going to design this article header. So let's say that every article on our blog website has like a title, an author, and a word count. And I'm actually gonna show you guys how we can use variables inside of this PHP file, and then we can actually give those variables values in another PHP file. So just stick with me for a second, and this is gonna make sense. Um, so this is gonna be our article header, and I'm actually just gonna make a header two. And what I'm gonna do in here is I'm gonna make some PHP tags. So I'm just gonna say less than sign, question mark, PHP, and then question mark, greater than sign. And in here, I'm just gonna print out the title. Inside of this header two, I'm printing out the value of this title variable. But you'll notice that I didn't actually give this a value and that's actually important. And you'll see later where we can actually give this a value. So in addition to the header two, I'm also going to create a header four for the author. So in here, again, we're gonna put some PHP tags and I'm gonna throw these here in the header four. And this time, instead of printing out the title, we're gonna print out the author. And then finally down here, we're gonna print out the word count. So I'm just gonna say word count colon. And again, I'm gonna put these PHP tags in here and we're gonna echo out the word count. So you'll notice that this is all this file is, right? I have a header two, I have a header four, and then I just have this like word count thing down here. So I, I'm not actually putting any information in here. I'm just printing out the values of variables but I didn't give any of these variables values yet. And I'll show you what we can do is we can actually include this article header file into another PHP file. And inside of that other PHP file, we can give these variables values. So down in this site.php file, I'm gonna come down here into my PHP tags and I'm just gonna say include, and I wanna include that file. So it's article header.php. So when I include this file, you'll see over here when I refresh my page that we get this little skeleton here. So if I actually um, viewed the page source, you'll see over here in the page source, we have this header two, we have this header four, and we have word count. So we actually got all of that information from that other file, 
but these things are all empty, so they don't have any values. And so what we can do is inside of this site.php file, where we included this article header, we can actually give these variables some values. So up here above, I'm gonna give the title variable a value, I'm gonna give the article variable a value, and I'm gonna give the word count variable a value. So I could say title, and we could just say this is my first post. So this is like my blog post title. And then down here, the author is going to be me, it's going to be Mike. And then we can also do word count. So over here, we'll say word count is equal to let's say 400. So I'm actually assigning these variables values in this PHP file Then I'm including this article header. Now when I refresh my page, you'll see that all of that information gets populated. So I basically created like a little template over here in this article header.php file. And I was basically like, okay, we're gonna put the title in here, we're gonna put the author in here and the word count in here. But I didn't give those values. I'm actually letting the pages that include the article header assign those values. So on this site.php file, I could give this you know, one title, one author and another word count. But if I was to create a separate PHP file, so if I created like two or three or four more PHP files, when I created different blog posts, I could give those different titles, different authors and different word counts. So even though I'm including the same file article header, depending on the file that I'm including it from, I can give it different information. And that is extremely powerful because we can basically define these little templates over here and then these templates will get populated with the data that, for example, like this site.php file assigns. So we can assign a value for title, a value for author, and a value for word count. And one of the other cool things is if I ever wanted to change the way that article header looked and felt, like all I have to do is change it over here. So I could change this to like an H1 instead of an H2. And I don't have to change anything over here in site.php everything is still gonna work correctly, but the styling will be updated. So this is essentially how you can take these includes to the next level. Like not only can you include static HTML, but you can also include dynamic PHP and you can populate the values in that PHP um, inside of the PHP file that's including it. So that's one really useful way that we can use these. Now I wanna show you guys one more thing we can do. We can actually include PHP files that have um, like variables and functions inside of them. So I'm actually just gonna get rid of this stuff. And you guys will see over here, I have this file, it's called usefultools.php. And if I open this up, it's a very simple file. Um, I have a variable over here, it's called feet in miles. And this is basically like how many feet there are in a mile. So this might be like some value that I wanna keep track of. And then I also have this function over here called say hi. It takes a name parameter and it just prints out hello name. So this is a very simple file, but let's say that I wanted to use all the functionality that was in this file. So I wanted to use that say hi function and I wanted to use that feet in mile attribute, but I wanted to use it inside of my site.php file. I could actually come down here and I could just say include useful tools.php. And now that I included this file, I can use all of that functionality and I can use that variable. So I could come over here and I could say like, say hi and I could pass in a name. And now I'm actually gonna be able to use that say hi function. So when I refresh the page, it says, hello, Mike. I could also use that variable. So I could print out feet in mile and this is gonna go ahead and print that out for me. So over here, we're printing out 5,280. So even though I didn't write this function and I didn't create this variable inside of my site.php file, inside of this file over here, I was still able to use that function and that variable because I included this PHP file. So a lot of times what people will do is they'll create a file just like this, useful tools, and they'll have a bunch of functions in it or they'll have variables in there. They'll have you know a bunch of PHP code in there and this is sort of like its own you know, PHP file. And then when they wanna use all that functionality, they'll just include the file um, inside of their PHP file, and then they can use those functions or those variables to do whatever they want. So those are two really powerful ways that you can use this include command. So over here with the article header, we basically created this like little template, and then we let 
um, whoever was including it decide what the title author and the word count would be and then over here we defined a bunch of like we defined a function and a variable and we were able to use that function and that variable um, just by including this file In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about classes and objects in PHP. Now, a lot of times in PHP, we're going to be dealing with different types of data. And in PHP, we have a certain set of data types that we can work with. So we can represent things like strings, which are just plain text. We can represent uh, whole numbers like integers and decimal numbers. We can also represent true false values like Booleans. But here's the problem is a lot of times when we're writing our PHP programs, we're not going to be able to represent everything just using like a single string or a single Boolean or a single number. Like there's a lot of like real world entities like in the real world that can't just be broken down into a single string or a single number. Like, for example, like we could represent something simple, like someone's age, for example, like I could create an age variable over here and I could set it equal to like 90, right? Maybe someone's 90 years old for something simple like that, like someone's age, we can easily represent it with, you know, something like a, a, a number, but there's a lot of things in the real world that can't be represented with just a number or a string or a Boolean. And essentially the problem is, is that we only have these, you know, three or four different data types. And so the types of information that we can represent and model in our programs is very limited. So PHP recognizes this problem, right? The problem that we can't represent everything in the real world just with a single string or number. So in PHP, we can actually create our own custom data types. And we can do that by creating things called classes. A class is essentially just a specification for a custom data type. So just like we have the string data type and like an integer data type, a Boolean data type, I could create my own custom data type that would allow me to model something in the real world, right? So a string, for example, represents like plain text. A number represents a number. But I could create a custom data type to represent something like a phone or I could represent like uh, a keyboard or I could represent a water bottle. Like I could represent anything I could think of in the real world using a class because I'm able to create my own custom data type. So in this tutorial, we are going to create our own class, which, like I said, is a custom data type and then we're gonna use that inside of our program. So let's say for the purposes of this tutorial that we're writing a piece of software for a library, right? So let's say that we want to you know, write some software that will help a library manage all of its books. So what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna create a book class. And this book class will basically allow us to represent and model books inside of our PHP program. So I'm gonna show you guys how we can create a class. I'm just gonna come down here in my PHP tags and I'm just gonna type class and then a space. And now we wanna type the name of the class that we wanna create. In my case, I'm gonna create a book class because I wanna be able to model a book inside of my program. And so I'm just gonna type book like that. And a lot of times when we're creating classes, people will use a capital letter. It's not necessary, but that's just kind of like a pretty common convention. Then I'm gonna type an open and close curly bracket and I'm just gonna enter a few times. So inside of this open and close curly bracket, we can start writing our custom data type. We can start creating our class. Now, whenever we create classes in PHP, what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna take this book and we're gonna break it up into a series of attributes. So remember, by default in PHP, we have like strings, we have numbers, and we have Booleans. So we can represent all of that information by default. But when we create a new data type, generally what we're gonna do is create the new data type based off of those other data types. So for example, with this book class, what I wanna do is define a series of attributes that represent a book. And so what I can do is I can actually start thinking of what different attributes are going to make up a book. Let's try to think of some. Um, I think a good set of attributes would be a title, an author, and a number of pages. So every book has a title, every book has an author, and every book has a number of pages. So inside of this book class, I can basically say that every book should have a title, an author, and a number of pages. And I can do that by defining attributes. So the way I can create attributes is I can just come in here and I can say var var, and then I can make a dollar sign and I'm gonna type out the name of the attribute. So like I said, a book is gonna have a title and I'm gonna type a semicolon. A book is also going to have an author and 
a book is also going to have a number of pages. So I'm just going to type pages. So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm telling PHP that I want to create a new book data type. And this book data type is going to be composed of a title, an author, and pages. So every book inside of our program will have a title, an author, and pages. And so essentially this class is a specification. So it's like a blueprint for creating a book inside of my program. What I can do now is I can come down here below this class declaration and I can actually create a book inside of my program. So I could model a real book in my PHP program and we can create a book in our program much like we would create a variable in our program. So I can make this dollar sign and I could just call this like book one, for example, and I'm going to set this equal to new book just like that. And essentially what this is doing is it's creating a new book data type and it's storing it inside of this book variable. So up here we created this book class and this is basically just a blueprint. It's a template for what a book is inside of our program. And down here I created an actual book and this is what we call an object. So an object is an instance of a class. Like I said, a class is a blueprint for our book, right? The book class is basically just defining what a book is. And down here, I'm creating an actual book. And so because this is an actual book, I can give it its own title, its own author, and its own number of pages. I could come down here and I could say book one, and I can make a dash and a greater than sign, and I can say title, and I'm just gonna set this equal to something. So I could say the title of this book is gonna be Harry Potter. So let's say that this is a Harry Potter book. And I could do this for each of the attributes. So I could also say book one author and the author of the Harry Potter books is JK Rowling. And then finally we can say book one and pages and we can give this a number of pages. So let's say it has 400 pages. So essentially what I did is I created a book in my program and I gave that book a title, I gave that book an author, and I gave that book a number of pages. So what I could do is I could actually come down here and I could print some of this information out. So I could echo out like book one title. And now this is gonna print out the title of book one. So we should get Harry Potter. And you'll see over here we're printing out Harry Potter. I could do the same thing for the other attributes. So like the author. Now we're going to be printing out the author of book one, which is JK Rowling. So before in my program, before I created that book class, I had no way of representing a book, right? I had no way of like storing or representing or modeling a book inside of my program. But now since I created this book class, I basically created a template for what a book is. I created a book data type. And now I can use that book data type to create variables. So now this book one variable is actually storing a book object. And remember, an object is just an instance of a book. So we created this Harry Potter book. And actually, why don't we come down here and we'll create another book. So I'm actually just going to copy this whole thing and we'll paste this down here. So in addition to creating a Harry Potter book, let's say we wanted to create a Lord of the Rings book. I'm actually going to change this to book two. So instead of being called book one, I'm changing this to book two and I can do the same thing. I can say new book. And now over here, we're going to change this. So this is going to be a Lord of the Rings book and the author is Tolkien. And let's say the Lord of the Rings has like 700 pages. So essentially what I'm doing now is I'm creating a new book and this time it's a Lord of the Rings book. The author is Tolkien and it has 700 pages. So here I have book one. This is a Harry Potter book. Um, the author is JK Rowling. Down here I have book two, and this is a Lord of the Rings book. So I could do the same thing for book two. I could print out like book two, and the author of book two is gonna be Tolkien. So now we're printing out Tolkien. So just like I can create two strings, like I could come down here in my program, and I could create like string one, and this would be like, whatever. And I could create another string like string two. And this is going to be whatever, just like I can create two strings in my program. I can also create two books. So we basically created a new data type and it's important to know the difference. So up here we have a class. 
A class is basically just a blueprint. It's a specification for what a book is in our program. We're basically defining the new data type. Down here, we're creating what are called objects. An object is an instance of a class. So an object is an actual book. So we have an, a book object and it has the title Harry Potter, the author JK Rowling and 400 pages. Down here we have another book object with the title Lord of the Rings, Tolkien and 700. So these are both books, but they have different titles, they have different authors and they have different pages. And that is the beauty of classes and objects is we can take something complex like a book and we can represent it inside of our programs. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk to you guys about constructors in PHP. A constructor is basically just a special uh, function that we can put inside of a class, which is going to get called when we create an object of that class. And we can actually use these constructors to do a bunch of cool stuff. And in this tutorial, I'm going to just give you an introduction into constructors, and then we're actually going to be able to use constructors to give our objects some default information. So it'll make it a lot easier for us to create objects in PHP. Now, if you're following along with this course, in the last tutorial, I talked to you guys about classes and objects. And we created this book class over here. And we basically said that the book is gonna have a title, an author, and a number of pages. And then down here, we created two book objects. So we have book one, and the title was Harry Potter, and this was like JK Rowling, 400 pages. And then we created another book object down here, and it was a Lord of the Rings book, and the author was Tolkien, and it had 700 pages. So we created our two book objects, and we created our book class, and everything went pretty well. So I wanna show you guys another thing we can do inside of this class, which is use something called a constructor. And a constructor, like I said, it's basically a function that's gonna get called whenever we create an object of the class. So down here, I'm gonna create a constructor and we'll kind of see what they do. So basically all we wanna do is just say function and I'm gonna type two underscores just like that. So one, two underscores and then construct just like that. And it needs to be named construct. If you don't name it exactly like that, then this isn't gonna work. So then over here, we're gonna make an open and close uh, curly bracket. So, so far, this is just a normal function, right? It, it, it looks exactly like any other functions that we've used throughout this course. Um, and what I wanna show you guys is that whenever we create a new book object, like we did down here, this function gets executed. So I'm gonna go ahead and just type out echo and I'll just say new book created. And so now actually I'm gonna type a break here too, just so we can see this a little bit better. So now when I go over here and I run this program on the browser, you'll see we're printing out new book created two times. And actually what's happening is we create these two books. So down here I say new book and I also say new book down here. And whenever we say this, like I said, this constructor function gets executed. So then over here, the first time we create the book, it says this and then we create another book and it prints this out. I wanna illustrate this a little bit further just to really kind of like instill what's going on. So this works just like any normal function. So just like any other function, I could pass it some information. So I could say like this function is gonna take a parameter called name and then let's say down here, I just wanna print out the name that gets passed in. So what I could do now down here when I create these new books, I could pass in a name. So I could pass in like Mike and I could pass in Tom and I'll show you guys when we run this program now, it's gonna print out Mike and then it's gonna print out Tom because those are the two values that are getting passed into the constructor. So we're printing out Mike and then we're printing out Tom, just like that. So hopefully you guys see the relationship now. Whenever I say new book down here, when I say this, it's actually calling that constructor function. So that is extremely important and this is actually really useful. So we can use this to do all sorts of stuff in our classes. Um, I just wanna point one thing out. So down here when we created these books, right? I created book one and I created book two, but you'll notice how many lines of code it took us to do this. So just to create one book up here, it took me four full lines of code, right? I had to actually like create the object and then I gave a value to the title, gave a value to the author and gave a value to the pages. 
right? So I had to individually say like book one title is equal to Harry Potter, book one author is equal to JK Rowling. Like it was a lot of work for me to create this book object and I had to do it twice. This was only creating two books. Imagine if we had to create like 20 or 30 of these different books in our program. The amount of lines of code it would take up would be ridiculous. Like this alone is taking up eight lines of code. So I wanna show you guys how we can use that constructor function that we just looked at in order to make it a lot easier for us to create these objects. So remember, we can pass information into this constructor, right? I specified that this would take some parameters and then we passed parameters in it down here and everything worked. What we can actually do is we can pass in the book's title, the book's author, and the number of pages of the book into this constructor function. And then inside this constructor function, we can give those values to the title, the author, and the pages. So essentially we can do everything we did down here, but inside of this constructor. So let me show you guys how that works. Over here in the constructor, I'm gonna specify that I want to take in three parameters. I'm gonna take in the first parameter, I'm just gonna call it a title. And the second parameter, I'm gonna call it a author. And the third parameter, I'm gonna call it a pages. And you'll notice I'm putting this little lowercase a in front of title, author, and pages. You don't have to do that. I'm just doing that because it's gonna be easier for us to see what's going on if these have, um, or if these are named like this. But you'll see in a second, we can name those whatever we want. So now that we specify that this needs to take some parameters, what we can actually do is we can take the values that the user passes in and we can assign them to the values for the object. So I can basically do exactly what I did down here, but just up here in this constructor. So what I wanna do is I wanna say dollar sign this, and this is actually a keyword in PHP and it's gonna to refer to the current object. And I'll kind of explain this a little bit more in a second, but I'm gonna say this title is equal to a title. So I'm setting the title of the current object equal to the value that got passed in. And I'm gonna do this for all of these. So I'll just say this author is equal to a author. And then finally we'll say this pages is equal to a pages. All right, so we basically said this title is equal to the title that got passed in this author is equal to the author that got passed in, and this pages is equal to the pages that got passed in. Now, I want you guys to notice some similarities. I'm saying this arrow title, and then down here I'm saying book one arrow title. And actually, these are doing the same thing. So when I use this keyword, it's basically just referring to the current object that's getting created, right? So down here, I create the object, and then I manually give it a title, an author, and a number of pages. Over here, when the object gets created and this construct function gets called, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm just doing it over here. And I can use this keyword in order to do the same thing that I did down here. So instead of saying book one, I just say this. And like I said, this keyword is just a keyword that we can use inside of this constructor function, which essentially just means that it's the title of the object that's getting created. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so what I can do now is whenever I create a new book, I can pass in all of this information. So I can pass in like Harry Potter and I can pass in the author Rowling and I can pass in the pages like 400. And now I can get rid of all of this because we're doing all that stuff inside of the constructor. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for Lord of the Rings real quick. All right, so I put all of this stuff in there for Lord of the Rings, and again, I'm gonna get rid of this. So now, instead of it taking eight lines of code for us to create these objects, it only takes two lines of code. And I'm calling this constructor and I'm passing in the title that I wanna to give to the object, the author that I wanna to give to the object, and the number of pages I wanna to give to the object. And then up here in the constructor, we're assigning the value of title to the title that got passed in, the value of author to the author that got passed in, et cetera. So basically now we did exactly what we did before, but we just saved ourselves a bunch of time and a bunch of code. All right, so I'm gonna prove this to you guys. I'm gonna come down here and why don't we just echo out like book one title. So we're gonna echo out the title of book one and we should get Harry Potter, so we do. 
So this is working exactly like it worked before. It's just way easier for us to create these um, objects. And the thing that's cool about this is I could still modify these values. So if I wanted to come over here, I could still say like book one title is equal to, and I could give this a different value. So we can make this like Hunger Games or something. And now the book one's title is gonna be updated. So instead of being Harry Potter, it's gonna be Hunger Games. The whole point of using this constructor is that we can give this information right up front. So I don't have to manually set it, I can just do it right away and the object has some initial information. So that is how constructors can be used and constructors are extremely useful. A lot of times when people create classes, they'll create constructors for those classes. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about object functions in PHP. An object function is basically just a function that we can define inside of a class, and then the different objects of that class can use that function. So um, these are super useful, and a lot of times we're gonna to wanna to create a bunch of these little object functions that will either tell us information about the current object or modify the current object or do something like that. So I'm gonna explain exactly what these are, exactly what they do and how we can use them. So over here, I created a student class. So this is basically a class that I created and it's essentially just modeling a student in my program. And I'm basically saying that every student has a name, a major and a GPA. So it's pretty simple. Um, and then down here, I have my constructor function. So I'm able to pass in the name, the major and the GPA. And then down here, I assign the name that gets passed in equal to the name of the actual object. So then here down below this class, I created a couple students. So I have a variable called student one and it's storing a student object whose name is Jim. He's a business major and he has a 2.8 GPA. And then down here we have student two, her name is Pam. She's an art major and she has a GPA of 3.6. So these are the two students that we can work with in our program. So, so far, hopefully this stuff makes sense, right? This is essentially what we talked about in the last couple lessons. But in this tutorial, I wanna show you guys how we can make object functions. And like I said, an object function is basically just a function that each of these objects could use in order to like do specific tasks or find out different information. So what I wanna do is I wanna write a function which is gonna tell me whether or not the current student is on the honor roll. So let's say that we're writing a program for like a college or a university, and we wanna be able to easily figure out whether or not a particular student is on the honor roll, right? And let's say that the rules for the honor roll is like you need a 3.5 or above. What I could do is I could actually create an object function up here inside of this class, and that function will be able to tell me whether or not the particular student has honors. So let's go ahead and do that, and hopefully as we go through, you'll kind of see what we're doing. So down here below this constructor, I'm gonna create a function. And I can create this just like I would create any other function. I'm just gonna say function, and then I'm gonna give it a name. So I'm basically gonna call this has honors. And this function is going to return a true or a false value. So if the student has honors, then it's gonna return true. If the student doesn't have honors, then it's going to return false. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and start writing this function. So like I said, the rules for honors is gonna be if you have a GPA of 3.5 or above, then we're gonna say you have honors. But if you have a GPA lower than 3.5, then you're not gonna have honors, so you're not gonna be on the honor roll. So what I could do is I could just create like a simple if statement. So I could say if, and I basically just want to check to see if the object that's calling this function has honors or not. So what I can do is I can come up here into these parentheses and I wanna check to see if the student's GPA is greater than or equal to 3.5. And the way that I can access the current student's GPA is just by saying dollar sign this hyphen greater than sign and then the name of the attribute. So it's gonna be GPA. And I wanna check to see if it's greater than or equal to 3.5. If it is greater than or equal to 3.5, then down here we can just return true. If it's not though, down here we'll just return false. So this is actually going to return a true or a false value. Now here's the thing, whenever we're printing out true or false values, um, PHP isn't actually gonna be able to print out false and it's not gonna be able to print out true either. 
So instead of passing booleans back here, I'm actually just gonna pass a string back true and a string back false. But just know that you most likely you'd wanna be passing back booleans. For the purposes of this tutorial though, I'm just gonna pass back these strings so it's a little bit easier for us to see what's going on. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and you'll see I can actually use this new function that we created on both of these objects. So I could, for example, echo out and I could say, student one hyphen greater than sign has honors. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna call that has honors function for student one. So when I come over here and I refresh my page and actually looks like I forgot to put a semicolon over here, sorry about that. So now when I refresh the page, this should say false. And the reason it says false is because student one has a GPA of 2.8. Right, Jim's GPA is a 2.8, so it's not 3.5 or greater, and therefore Jim is going to not have honors. If I came down here then and I changed this to student two, so now this is gonna be Pam, Pam is gonna have honors, so this should give us back true. And you can see over here, we're getting true. And that's because Pam's GPA is 3.6 which means it's above 3.5. So let's go back over to this function and I wanna explain it a little bit more. You'll notice that I wrote this function one time and I was able to use it on the Pam object and I was also able to use it on the Jim object. And that's one of the cool things about these object functions is I can write the function one time and then all of the instances of the student class can use it. So every student object can use this has honors function in order to figure out whether or not they have honors. And here's the thing, you'll notice that when Jim called this has honors function, we used Jim's GPA in order to figure out whether or not he had honors. When Pam called the has honors function, we used Pam's GPA 3.6 in order to figure out whether or not Pam had honors. And this is actually really significant. So when I call this function on the Pam object, over here, when I say this arrow GPA, that means that we're gonna use Pam's GPA. When I call the has honors function on the Jim object, again, this is gonna go ahead and use Jim's GPA. So by saying dollar sign this um, GPA, this is always gonna refer to the GPA of the object that's calling the function. And that's why these are so powerful. So a lot of times what people will do is they'll create like a bunch of these little functions inside of their class. And you can see like this has honors function comes in handy a lot, right? Because this is essentially specifying the qualifications for honors, right? So if I wanted, I could make the qualifications for honors be a 2.5. And now technically Jim's gonna qualify for honors or I could make it a, you know, 4.5 or a 4.0 or something like that. But in addition to a has honors function, I mean, I'm sure we could think of a bunch of other functions that we might wanna use on a particular student, but hopefully that makes sense. And really what you wanna do is whenever you create a class in PHP, you always wanna think about what are the different functions, the different object functions that you can include inside of that class. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about getters and setters in PHP. Now, getters and setters are basically special functions that we can create inside of our PHP classes, which allow us to control the access that people have to the attributes of those classes. So I understand that that definition might not make any sense, um, but in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly why getters and setters are useful and how we can use them in our classes. So first, let me just show you guys what I have down here. I created a class, it's called movie, and this class has a title and it has a rating. So it has two attributes, title and rating, and then down here I just created a constructor so we can pass in a title and a rating and then those values get assigned to the object attributes. Then down here, uh, like right below the class, I created a movie object. So it's just called Avengers and it's just the Avengers movie and it's rated PG-13. So pretty simple. Basically, we're just creating a movie inside of our program. So this is pretty cool. And then down here, I was printing out the Avengers rating just to kind of prove that everything works. So I wanna to talk to you guys about one potential problem that we might run into with this movie class. Let's say that we're designing a program that is going to be able to work with and store a bunch of different movies, right? 
And one of the things about a movie is that every movie has a rating, right? So this movie is PG-13. Some other movies are like GR, um, PG, NR, right? There's a bunch of these different ratings that we can give to these movies. Now here's the thing, there's really only like a certain number of valid ratings for a movie, right? We have like G, PG, PG-13, R, and then NR. So NR would be like not rated, right? I mean, for the most part, these are all of the like valid ratings that we can give to a movie. Maybe there's some other ones, but let's just say that these are the only valid ratings that we could give to a movie. Well, here's the problem with this movie class is that over here, I could actually give this a invalid rating. So I could come over here and I could give this a rating of like dog, right? Just some random word. And now when we print out the rating, you'll see we're printing out dog. So I was able to give this movie a rating that wasn't one of the like valid ratings. And if you're just creating like a simple movie class, you might not care about that. But if you're designing like a real application that's gonna be able to store and work with movies, you might wanna limit the ratings that these movies can have. So you might not want this movie to be to have a rating of dog, right? You might want it to only be able to be one of these valid ratings over here. And up until this point, we haven't really talked about how we can control what values can be stored inside of these object attributes. But we're gonna talk about that right now. So I'm basically gonna show you guys how we can make it so the user can't give the rating a value other than G, P, G, P, G, 13, R, or N, R. We're basically gonna tighten down this class and make it so the rating can only have a certain number of values. So in order to do this, we're actually gonna have to do a couple different things. So I'm gonna change this back to PG-13. The first thing that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to modify this rating attribute. So up here in my program, you'll notice I'm creating my rating attribute. I'm just saying public dollar sign rating. So right now, down here in my program, I'm able to access the rating, right? I can print it out, I can modify it if I wanted to, I could basically do whatever I wanted to it. But the first step in controlling what ratings can get put in here is gonna be to cut off access to this rating attribute. So I basically wanna make it so I can't print out the rating attribute, so I can't modify the rating attribute, so I can't do anything to it. So for example, like right now, I could come over here and say Avengers, rating is equal to dog. There's nothing stopping me from doing this. And over here, it's the same thing, it's dog, right? What I wanna do is make it so I can no longer do that. And what we can do is we can come up here and we can make this a private attribute. So this brings me to the first point that I wanna to talk to you guys about in this tutorial, which are called visibility modifiers. And a visibility modifier is basically a keyword that's going to tell PHP what code is able to access and use different attributes in our programs. Now, you'll notice over here that I have this public keyword right here. And what this public keyword means is that this attribute is visible to any other code in my PHP program. So when I say public over here, it means I can come down here, I can give this rating a value, and I can print out that value onto the screen. Public is essentially just like it's open to everybody. So everybody can access it, everybody can modify it, everybody can do whatever they want to it. Uh, previously in this course, we were using this keyword there. And I intentionally use this keyword there just because I didn't want to talk about these visibility modifiers until this tutorial. But there basically does the same thing. So there and public um, for the most part are kind of interchangeable. Generally though, in like modern day PHP, you're gonna be seeing people use this public keyword. Again, I wanted to introduce that in this tutorial. So that's why we were using there in the previous tutorials. But whenever I say public and then specify the attribute inside of a class, it basically means that this attribute is open to the world, it's open to everybody. But what we wanna do with this rating attribute is we wanna tighten it up. So we wanna make it so that nobody can access it outside of this movie class. What I could do is I could come over here and I could give this a different visibility modifier called private. So I could say private rating. And basically what this means is that any code outside of this movie class now, so in other words, any code outside of these open and closed curly brackets isn't gonna be able to access the rating directly. So down here, we're not gonna be able to set the rating like this and we're not gonna be able to print it out. So if I came over here and I refreshed my program, you'll see we're getting this fatal error. It says, 
cannot access private property movie rating. Basically, it's telling us like, hey, that movie's rating is private, so you can't access it anymore. And like I said, when we set something as private, it means that only code inside of the class that it's declared is able to use it. So for example, down here, we're able to set the rating just fine, right? We have no problems doing that. It's because this code is inside the movie class, but any code that's outside the movie class isn't gonna be able to mess with this rating attribute. So that's the first step in order to make it so we can only set specific ratings on this movie. The second set is going to be creating something called a getter and a setter. And getters and setters are special functions that we can write inside of our classes, which will allow the user to set the attribute. So it'll allow the user to essentially do something like this, and it'll allow the user to get the attribute essentially do something like this. So because rating is private, I can't set it directly anymore, and I can't get it directly anymore down here to print it out. So what we can do is we could actually come up here and we can create some functions. So I'm gonna come up here and create a function and I'm just gonna call this get rating. And what this is gonna do is it's basically just going to return this rating. So whenever somebody calls this get rating function, it's basically gonna give them the rating. And so down here, I'm actually just gonna get rid of this line of code. If I wanted to get the rating and print it out, instead of saying avengers.rating, remember this is throwing an error we can't do this. What I can do though, is I can say Avengers arrow get rating. And now I should be able to get the rating, even though the rating is private. So you can see now we're able to get PG 13. So I can get the rating using this get rating function. I can also create a set rating function. So I could come down here and say function, and I can just call this set rating. And this set rating function is actually gonna take one parameter. It's gonna take one argument. Up here, I'm just gonna call this rating. So we're gonna allow the user to pass in a rating into here. And then down here, what I can do is I can say this rating is equal to rating. So I'm setting the rating for this object equal to the rating that got passed in. And basically this will allow me to update the rating. So with this set rating function, I could come down here and I could say like Avengers set rating and I could technically give this any rating that I wanted. So if I wanted, I could give this a dog, right? And basically what this is doing is it's allowing us to set the rating and get the rating even though the rating itself is private. So up here, rating is private. We're not able to access it outside of the class, but by using this get rating function and this set rating function, I can both get it and set it. So now that we have these set up, we can actually start enforcing some rules. So like I said, the goal is to make it so we can't do this. So we can't set the rating equal to something that's not G, PG, PG 13, R or NR, right? That is the overall goal of this tutorial. And so what I can do is inside of this set rating function, I can actually enforce that rule. So over here, instead of just saying this rating is equal to rating, I'm gonna get rid of this. And instead I'm gonna put an if statement in here and I'm gonna check to see if the rating that they passed in is one of the valid ratings that we specified down here. And if it is, then I'll let them set the rating. But if it's not, then we can do something else. So I'm basically gonna create an if statement. And inside of this if statement parentheses, I basically wanna check to see, like I said, if the rating that they passed in is one of the valid ratings. Now there's a couple of different ways that we could check this. I'm just gonna go ahead and use a bunch of or statements. So I'm basically gonna say, if rating is equal to G or rating is equal to PG, et cetera. So I'm gonna go off and create one of these for each one of those ratings and then we'll come back and see how it looks. So I actually went ahead and I created this like super long if statement and honestly there's easier ways that we could do something like this. Um, but just for simplicity's sake, I wanted to do it this way. So down here I said, if the rating is equal to G or the rating is equal to PG 
or the rating is equal to PG-13, or the rating is equal to R, or the rating is equal to NR. So if it's equal to one of these ratings, in other words, if it's a valid rating, then down here we can basically just say this rating is equal to rating. And the reason I'm doing this is because if it passes this if statement condition, that means it's one of the valid ratings. So we can just go ahead and set it, right? That means that they passed in a valid rating and we're good to go. Otherwise though, I'm gonna create an else block over here. If they didn't enter in a valid rating, why don't we just say this rating is equal to NR. So why don't we just pass it an NR? So let's say if they try to enter in a rating of like dog or some other nonsense, then we're basically just gonna say the movie's not rated because they didn't give us a valid rating. All right, so the whole point is that now if I wanna set the rating to something like dog, it has to go through this set rating function. And when it goes through that set rating function, we have this if statement, which is gonna filter out all of the invalid ratings and set them equal to NR. So now essentially what's happening is when I run this program, even though I passed in dog over here, now when I print out the rating, it's gonna be NR. And that's because I passed in an invalid rating, it didn't make it through that if statement, and it just got set to NR. But if I set a valid rating, like if I set this equal to R, now it's gonna be fine with that. So it's basically just gonna be able to print out R because hey, that's a valid rating, right? All right, so that's basically how that setter is gonna work. And there's actually one more thing that we have to do. So there's one problem with this program the way it is, and it's this constructor. So the way that we have the program written, I could come over here and I could still set this equal to dog, by passing it into the constructor. And you'll see over here, it's still able to be set to dog. So the last thing that we can do is just come up here to this constructor and instead of saying this rating is equal to rating, we can just say this set rating and we can pass in rating into here. So now every place where this rating gets set is going through this set rating. So now we're not gonna be able to get away with putting dog inside of the constructor. Now it's gonna be set to not rated like that. So this attribute is officially locked down. We officially cannot give a movie an invalid rating. It's impossible for me to do that. I cannot give a movie a rating other than NRR, PG-13, PG, or G. Even if I try to, like even if I come over here and pass it into the constructor or I come down here and you know I say like, Avengers set rating and I, you know, pass in some nonsense string. That's not going to work, right? And the way that I was able to do that was I made this attribute private. So I set rating equal to private and I created a getter function and I created a setter function. The getter function basically just returns the rating and the setter function has this if statement, which is going to filter out any bad ratings for us and just set them equal to NR. And then finally, up here in the constructor, I called that set rating function. So that is basically how we can use getters and setters. And one important takeaway from this tutorial was public and private. Again, um, before in the tutorial, I was just using this var keyword. And again, I was just using that because I wanted to explain public and private in this tutorial, and I didn't want you guys to get confused. Um, but for the most part, people are only gonna be using public and private. You won't see people using var too much, although you can use it. Um, but remember, public means that the attribute is open to anybody, any program, anywhere. Private though means that only code inside the movie class is gonna be able to access this attribute. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about inheritance in PHP. Now inheritance is basically where a class can inherit all of the functionality, all the attributes from another class in PHP. And this is actually a really useful situation. And the best way to kind of wrap your head around inheritance is just to see an example. So I'm gonna show you guys an example of what this is, how it works, and then hopefully you can understand like basically what's going on. All right, so down here in my program, I've created a class called Chef. And this is basically just like modeling a chef in my program. And this is a very simple class. The chef can do three things. The chef can make chicken, so we have this make chicken function. The chef can make salad, we have this make salad function. 
and the chef can also make a special dish. And basically all these functions do is like when the chef makes chicken, it just prints out, hey, the chef's making chicken, or when the chef makes a salad, it prints out the chef makes salad, and for the special dish, it's barbecue ribs. So down here outside of the class, I created a chef and I told the chef to make some chicken. So now over here in my web browser, you see when I refresh the page, it just says the chef makes chicken. So this is a, you know, like I said, pretty basic program. We have our class, it has a bunch of functions in it. We created an object and we told the object to make chicken. But let's say that I'm looking at my program and I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I want another chef in my program. So in addition to having this chef class over here, let's say that I wanted to create another chef alongside of it. So let's say in addition to just having like a generic chef up here, I also wanted to have an Italian chef. So like a more specialized type of chef. Well, I could just create another class. So I can just come over here and say class, and why don't we call this Italian chef? And I'm, again, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make an open and closed curly bracket. And down here in the Italian chef class, I could you know write some functions or some attributes or whatever. But let's say that in our program, we wanted the Italian chef to be able to do everything that the normal chef could do plus a bunch of other stuff, right? So just like this normal chef, the Italian chef can also make chicken, make salad and make a special dish. So the Italian chef can do everything that the normal chef can do. And let's say the Italian chef can also do some other stuff as well. Well, this is a situation where we can use something called inheritance. And inheritance is basically where I could have my Italian chef inherit all of the functionality from the normal chef. So I could just come over here and say Italian chef extends chef. And basically what this means now is the Italian chef is gonna be able to use all the same functions as the normal chef. I could actually come down here and in addition to just creating a normal chef, I'm also gonna create an Italian chef. So I'm just gonna paste this and I'm gonna change this to Italian chef. All right, so in addition to this normal chef up here, I also created an Italian chef. It's a new Italian chef, and I'm telling this Italian chef to make chicken. Now, here's the thing. Up here in my Italian chef class, I didn't actually define a make chicken method. Like, nowhere in here does it say make chicken, right? It's, it's just not in here. But what I did was I extended all the functionality from the chef class. And the chef class over here has a make chicken function. So because the chef has a make chicken function and I'm inheriting all the functionality from the chef class, my Italian chef is gonna be able to make chicken no problem. So now when I run my program, you'll see it says the chef makes chicken and this is that normal chef and down here, the Italian chef is also making chicken. So without having to write out the make chicken function down here, I was still able to use it because of inheritance. And that's why inheritance is so cool. But here's the thing, like this Italian chef, if it only has the functionality of the chef class, there's no purpose for it. So over here, we could actually create another function. I'm gonna call this make pasta. So let's say in addition to making chicken salad and special dish, the Italian chef can also make a mean bowl of pasta. So down here, we could just do basically what we did before. So I'm just gonna echo out like, so now down here, the Italian chef could make pasta. But here's the thing, this normal chef isn't gonna be able to make pasta. So I couldn't come over here and say normal chef make pasta. This is actually gonna throw an error. And that's because the chef doesn't have a make pasta method. Only the Italian chef is capable of making pasta because only the Italian chef has that function. So over here now when I refresh the page, you can see the Italian chef is making pasta. Anytime we have two classes like the chef and the Italian chef, where the Italian chef can do everything the chef can do plus some other stuff, we wanna use inheritance. And this can be extremely powerful. I wanna show you guys one more thing that we can do with this though, and it's called overriding a function. So down here, I'm gonna have both of these guys print out make special dish. So both chefs are gonna go ahead and make a special dish. And you'll see that both of them are gonna make barbecue ribs. So the special dish is barbecue ribs and then the Italian chef also makes barbecue ribs. 
But let's say that the Italian chef doesn't want to make barbecue ribs. So the normal chef's special dish is barbecue ribs. That's awesome. But let's say that we want the Italian chef to have a different special dish. Well, I can actually do something called overriding a function. Basically down here, I could override the make special dish function that I inherited from the chef class. And it's actually really easy. All I have to do is just come down here and I could just say function make special dish. So you'll notice I'm using the same name as the function that was up here in the chef class. And then over here, I can basically just put my own thing. So I could just say like echo the chef makes chicken parm. Maybe that's the chef's special dish. So now when I come down here and I say chef makes special dish and Italian chef makes special dish, they're both going to be making different special dishes. So now the Italian chef makes chicken parm and the normal chef makes barbecue ribs. And that's what we would call overriding a function. Basically, we're overriding the make special dish function that we got from the chef when we used inheritance. And that can come in handy all the time. So that's sort of the basics of inheritance and really the basics of using this extends keyword. As your PHP programs get more complex and as you start using more and more complex classes, um, using something like inheritance can become very useful. So hopefully all that makes sense and hopefully now you guys have a solid understanding of what inheritance is.